Hello, this is Dave Gilbert, and welcome to the commentary track for the Blackwell Legacy. This is the voice you're going to be hearing babble at you throughout the course of the game. And if you ever get uh, tired of me talking, or if I'm talking too much, or you just get sick of the sound of my annoying voice, you can uh, just hit any key on the keyboard, and I will dutifully disappear and shut up. Uh, to start with, I guess I just want to thank you for purchasing the game. That's really cool of you. Uh, you're, you're keeping me in coffee and, and stuff while I, while I write these games. A um, bit of history, I guess. This this game originally started as a freeware game way back when, 2002-2003. Uh, it was a game called Bestowers of Eternity, and it was quite a bit different. Um, it starred uh, Rose Angela Blackwell, and uh, it involved Joey to a, to a lesser extent. Um, and I never actually finished the game. It was never complete. But I released it anyway and slapped a really lame to be continued at the end and kind of ended on a really bad, nasty cliffhanger, which had everyone really, really annoyed at me. But people really seemed to like the game. And so earlier this year, when I was thinking about making episodic games, I thought about Bestowers. And I thought it was well suited to an episodic format because you have two characters that you could you know, relate to, you could follow throughout a series, and there was a nice backstory that could be revealed over time, and since they were investigators, uh, each game could be another investigation. So I thought that worked out well. So that's a bit of history for you. That's how this game got started and conceived. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the game. Or rather, I hope you did enjoy the game, because I do recommend playing the game first, because I will be giving stuff away. So uh, if you want to avoid evil spoilers, and you haven't played the game, I suggest you turn this commentary off. Otherwise, click that new game button, and we'll begin. Hi, this is Dave Gilbert, and you have activated the five years later commentary track for Blackwell Legacy. It has been, obviously, five years since I released the game, and since I've been upgrading and revamping the game uh, a little bit, I thought it would be a good opportunity to hop on the mic again and voice any additional thoughts uh, now that so much time has passed and other Blackwell games have been released uh, since I made this game. A um, little bit of warning, if you have the original commentary active, you're going to be hearing my voice a lot. <laughs> so just to warn you, um, other than that, uh, I will be interrupting you as you play. So um, let's continue on. I made a very small change to this uh, opening scene. Originally, Rosa walked in from off screen. She walked in from the right, stopped where she is now, and then she delivered her lines and tossed the ashes off. Uh, and I decided to change that um, and have it start with her already standing there looking out. Uh, it's a very minor change, but it's effective because now, originally, it was Rosa walks in, delivers her lines, and it just seemed very quick. She didn't take a moment to reflect. She just sort of walked in and did it. And this way... Uh, who knows how long she's been standing there looking out over the water. Uh, so it, it kind of make, gives it a little bit of a more softer edge. She's a little bit more reflective, and uh, you sort of start in media res. You don't know why she's there. Uh, so it's just a very, very tiny change, and I've spent, you know, all this time talking about it. But I think it was an effective one. So, I guess this is it. Years of watching and waiting and hoping, and it comes down to this. Do I love you? Do I miss you? I don't know for sure, I hardly know you, but you're the closest thing to family I've got, and I suppose that's something. Goodbye, Auntie. Wherever you are. This is, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge, which connects Brooklyn to downtown Manhattan. And uh, what a view, man, what a view. Uh, what a great way to start the game off. You can't actually do what Rosa just did. There is a, a second level to the bridge below this one. So Rosa actually just poured her aunt's ashes onto oncoming traffic. But that's something I chose to ignore just because I, I love this view so much. And it was a nice way to open the game. The guy who drew this uh, picture, his name is Chris Fimo. Uh, he's the second background artist who came on board kind of towards the end. Uh, Tom Scary kind of got this demanding full-time job and wasn't able to do the exteriors. And I actually had to run out to the Brooklyn Bridge and take this picture because there wasn't a... I tried looking online for a nice reference picture, but it didn't have what I wanted. There were a lot of pictures taken of the bridge, but not a lot of pictures taken of the view from the bridge. So I actually had to trudge out there and take the picture, and Chris drew it from that. The 
the guy who did all the sprites in the game. His name is Ian Schleffer. He did Rose's walk cycle, and there's something really perfect about this walk cycle. Uh, she just walks. She's very kind of hesitant and aggressive at the exact same time, and I, I can't exactly pinpoint how it works, but it works. So um, good work, Ian. I don't know how you did it, dude, but you did it. What a morning. At least I'm home now. There are bars over the windows. I'm not getting in that way. Hi there. Um, hi? So who are you visiting today? Huh? Seriously, who are you here to see? I can't let you in unless you tell me. Um, I live here? No, you don't. I know everybody in the building. I don't know you. Matt Gardner, playing the doorman here, is a guy uh, from Arizona, this amazing cartoonist. Uh, he does a lot of these Flash cartoons on Newgrounds. You should check him out. His username there is Wogoat, W-O-G-O-A-T. And uh, he does these fantastically hysterical X-Men parodies. So if you're into X-Men, you should, you should check that out. Uh, he does the voices for his own cartoons mostly. So uh, I knew he had good equipment. I know he could, uh, he could do voice acting. So um, when he offered to do a voice, I said, hey, yeah, sure. Come on, check it out. Uh, he also did most of the sketches for the close-up photographs in this game. Um, yeah, so that's Matt. Really? I live here. Nice try. I know everyone in this building, and I don't know you. Sorry. I've lived here for five years. Then how come I've never seen you before? I have no idea. Doesn't matter. If you lived here, I'd know you. That's all there is to it. Who the hell are you? Jim Birdo. All right. Jim, where's the regular doorman? Jeez, where have you been? He's on strike. He's what? Strike. All the building servicemen in the city are doing it. Union rules or something. I stepped in to help because I know everybody. How come nobody told me? Notices were posted all over the building. I put them up myself. If you lived here, you'd have seen them. Who pays attention to things like that? Well, that's not my problem. How long is the strike going to last? I don't know. Could be a couple hours or a couple days. Depend on whether they reach a settlement or not. I don't know the details. Listen, I really live here. Fourth floor, number 4E. 4E. Hmm. Isn't that apartment empty? No! I live there, and I want to go there. Thank you very much. Oh. Hmm. Maybe you're telling the truth. He sees reason. Thank God. Do you have any ID? A driver's license or something? Yes. I have a driver's license. It's upstairs. In my desk drawer. Crap. <laughs> Come on, this is New York. Who actually drives? True. But I still can't let you in unless you prove you live here. I have my apartment key. Will that do? Sorry, no. That could be any key. Well, let's go upstairs and see if it works. And leave the door unattended? Can't do it. Sorry. Please, I've had a really tough morning. I need to get home. Sorry, lady. Rules are rules. Okay, I have no ID, and you don't know me. What can I do to prove that I live here? Hmm. Well, can anyone in the building vouch for you? I'm not sure. I mean, I don't really know anybody here. How long have you lived here again? Be quiet. Not all of us are social butterflies. Okay, whatever. Hey, what about Nishanti Sharma? She could vouch for you. Who is this Nis... uh, Nish... Nishanti. Nishanti Sharma. She lives in 4F. You know, right next door to 4E. You really don't get out much, do you? Your point? Nothing, but I'm sure she could vouch for you. Great, call her up. He's not here. 
Of course she isn't. So I gotta wait here all day for her. You might have to. Although, she usually goes to Washington Square Park in the mornings. You can look for her there. Out of my way. I'm going in. I wouldn't do that. Why? Are you going to stop me? Me? No. But I've got a cell phone in my pocket with 911 program, Dan. All I have to do is hit send and the cops will be here in five minutes. Are you serious? Totally serious. I don't believe this. So, let me get this straight. You want me to go all the way to the park to look for a woman who might be there, and if she recognizes me, then, and only then, I'll be granted the privilege of entering my own home? That's pretty much it, yeah. This is really stupid. I'm not the one who forgot my ID. I'll be back. See you around. As I was upgrading this game, there was a, a real strong instinct uh, and temptation to play George Lucas and change everything. Uh, and I resisted that. Uh, but this first puzzle and section is is would have been at the top of the list uh i was worried that when i started this commentary a lot of it would be me just going what was i thinking and apologizing a lot and, and this is one of them this was not the best way to kick off a series with this very arbitrary very gamey puzzle and at the time my way of thinking was well rose is this very she's this very socially recalcitrant person and this is kind of a way of forcing her out into the world which yeah as a character study it works but as a game it's a very annoying puzzle and it's it's the, the first thing you do in the game you're told no and one thing i've learned about about game design and making games is that you want the first couple of actions to feel rewarding and, and to feel, you want to feel good about the stuff you do and here there's just brick walls thrown at you no matter what you do like within the first two seconds of playing and that was bound to frustrate people and I would have designed this completely differently if I could start over um, but I didn't change it uh, a because I, I don't think I think that would have been ridiculous to completely change everything um, so I kept it as it was and uh, I'll apologize in this commentary The map screen was hard to design because three of the locations were fairly close to each other and one of the locations was, was far away. So it was hard to really come up with a good um, design for it. Originally I just had this stupid little menu um, just for the beta testing stage. And then finally E.L. Jammer, a uh, graphic artist who came on board originally to do um, photographs. Uh, I'll talk about that later. but. Um, he uh, offered to do extra stuff, and I, one of the first things I asked him to do, I said, hey, could you come up with a, a map screen? I'm totally stumped. And he came up with this design and uh, these big icons that represent um, different areas, the locations you go to. And it, it works really well because um, the icons are big enough that the fact that um, some of them, one of the locations is farther away, uh, than the others, it didn't really matter so much. So um, I, I can't quite explain how it worked, but it, it does work and uh, I think it works well. Washington Square. It's been a while since I've been here. Still looks the same, I guess. Although the dog park is empty, I wonder why. This is a real place. Washington Square is a real park and this dog park does exist and it's usually a lot busier than it is uh, than you see now there are usually lots of little dogs running around and i have lots of fond memories of this place there was a a dog uh, my friend's dog that i was looking after a few years ago and i brought the dog to this dog park and it was heck of a lot of fun just uh watching the dogs just run around and i made the mistake of bringing a breakfast sandwich with me one morning and uh, i was very popular with the dogs that day each Blackwell game has uh, an area that is um, based in a real place, 
And this is obviously Washington Square Park, and this is the dog run in Washington Square Park. And it's funny how most of the locations that are based on real places, and I took care to like get photograph references for the artists, they have all changed since their debut in in their game. This area of Washington Square Park is completely different now. The entrance is on the street side of the park. Uh, this area is all fenced off. They renovated the park um, last year, and it's uh, for the most part it looks the same, but the dog run is completely different. So you can no longer go to the park and, and see this image, which is a shame. But you can play Blackwell and virtually walk through Washington Square of years past. Please note, Dog Walking Park is closed until further notice. Hmm. The dog park is empty. There's no reason to go in there. Mmm. Now I'm getting a stress headache. I need to get home. There is a slight selfish aspect to writing a game or a story or a film that takes place um, in a real world location, especially when it's your hometown or your home city. And that is you get to include locations that you really love. And this place, Washington Square Park, man, uh, it's just... I love this place. It's right by NYU. You get all the all the all the kids there. You get all the um, kids, meaning college kids. Uh, you get all the political rallies, the musicians, just all sorts of life just flows through this place, and it's just a great place to go and hang out. You know, sometimes I, when things get busy or hectic, I would sit down on a bench. I'd look at this exact view that you're looking at now, just munch on a sandwich, drink a cup of coffee or something, and just watch the world spin by. Um, this is my home right here, and I'm very happy that uh, Chris Fimo managed to get it right. Um, I really wanted to stress the fact that I wanted this to be accurate. That arch in the background, that fountain, they're so iconic uh, to Washington Square Park and New York in general. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I got to include this, uh, this location. That's her. I recognize her from my building. Nishanti Sharma, was it? This is going to be awkward. This, again, is one of those moments I, I wish I thought a little bit more carefully about when I made the game five years ago. As a character study, I think it works really well. Um, but a lot of people hated this moment, and I can't blame them. Uh, here, Rose is trying to speak to Nishanti, but she's too shy to interrupt her in front of all of these people. And that's a very Rosa thing to do. It's totally understandable. But as a, as a gamer, as a player, wanting to do something and being told no, uh, being told not by the environment, being told no not by other characters or by the environment or even by the game, but by the character that you're playing. Your avatar is saying, no, you can, no, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. And it just creates this immediate disconnect between the player and the character that um, I think was a very bad thing. Uh, if I was redoing this now, I'd have come up with something different. It worked as a character study, um, and a lot of people liked that for what it was. But I think as a game device as a as an actual game i did think it failed um and so but uh, again i was new <laughs> this is uh, my first attempt at a commercial game so hopefully i could be forgiven uh excuse i can't do it i can't just barge up to her not in front of all those people they're all staring I'm not untying the dog's leash. Nishanti would kill me. I don't think so. So I want to give some advice to any of you budding adventure game designers out there who might conceive of using a dog and a dog leash um, in their game. I want you to heed my warning because uh, and, and benefit from the uh, value of my experience because I want to tell you firsthand, this dog leash 
nearly killed me. And when I say it nearly killed me, I mean it nearly killed me. Because, holy crap, this dog leash would not do what it was supposed to do. Um, it's, a, it's a line that was drawn um, kind of on the fly using the engine um, from one point to another point. And I had to um, kind of use encoding to tell the dog leash where to go. And holy crap, was this, was this annoying. Either the dog leash would spontaneously uh, disappear for a second or two, or it would draw itself um, above the dog's head, or it would be absolutely perfect, and then the dog would turn, and the dog leash would be in a totally different location. Uh, getting Once I got that right, getting the dog leash to work perfectly while the dog walked around that friggin' lamppost, um, that proved to be an incredibly daunting task. I mean, this dog leash... I, I hate this dog leash. I, I hate it so much. I want to take this dog leash, rip it up, set it on fire, take the ashes, put them in the dumpster, and then set fire to the dumpster, and then take those ashes and then step on them. Ugh, I hate you, dog leash. God damn it, I hate you. Wow, um, th that felt really good. Um, yeah, so uh, dog leash, very hard. Oh, for heaven's sake. Don't worry, Moti, I'm coming. If you listened to the original commentary, you would have heard me rant about that dog leash and how hard it was to code. Uh, it plagues me even now, five years later, when I was upgrading this code, all of the um, commands that I used to create the dog leash five years ago uh, are no longer used in the current version of the Adventure Game Studio engine. So all of that hard work that I did five years ago, all that ranting that you heard me do in the previous commentary, that was all for nothing because uh, I had to redo it all again. Uh, so I had to figure out new commands, a whole new way of doing things because all those commands, those original commands no longer work. So yeah, no more dog leashes. They're all better. I can't take you anywhere, can I? Oh, it's you! The lady next door! Yeah, hi. Rhonda, isn't it? No, Rosangela. Well, Rosangela, I hope my friend here hasn't been giving you any trouble. That's a cute dog you've got. Isn't he just? Normally he behaves, but he seems to have taken a shine to you. Oh, great. Anyway, I don't think we've formally met. I'm Nishanti. Rosangela. So you said. Oh, right. Um... Yes? I have a strange favor to ask. Go ahead and ask. What are neighbors for? You know that building servicemen strike? Yes. Jim Birdo is covering, isn't he? Yeah, that's the problem, see. He doesn't recognize me. Oh? Oh. So you need me to vouch for you? Yeah, I know this is pretty stupid. Don't worry about it. Moti is getting a little cranky anyway. Let's get you home. Thanks. Mm. Are you alright? I'm fine. I just need to get home. Alright. Let's keep walking. I mentioned earlier how Chris Fimo came on board kind of towards the end. And Tom Scary had started to draw this picture, and I kind of implied that Chris, you know, start with that and just finish it. But um, I gave him the reference picture, and then he said, "Could I just, you know, could I just do it my way? Could I just do what I want?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." Uh, I misunderstood. I thought he meant, you know, could he do the picture his own way? You know, kind of using you know, the picture as a reference. He didn't realize that it was a real location. He thought I just showed him that picture just to show kind of what I had in mind he didn't realize it was a real place. So when he ended up drawing the picture, thank God it was just an outline, he had a bridge in the background, he had, you know, a river, he had this, you know, it was just totally wrong. And I took one look at it and it was just so detailed and so wonderful. And I just said, oh God, look, I'm sorry, this is, this is great, but uh, it's wrong, I'm sorry. And um, I, I told him it was a real place, and he didn't realize it was a real place, and it was this horrible misunderstanding, but he was a good sport about it. Thank God he just did an outline and didn't actually do the whole, the whole picture, because you see how, how beautiful this picture is, and it would have been a real shame if he had to uh, do all that work for nothing. Hello, Jim. Hey, Miss Sharma. Jim, this is Rosangela. She lives here. She does? Okay. Sorry about earlier. Had to be sure. 
Well, now you're sure. And you must be so proud of yourself. Well... Never mind. Just get out of my way. Well, here we are. Yes. Finally. That stupid kid. Well, perhaps. But try not to be so hard on him. We're all neighbors, after all. Yeah, I guess. <coughs> Looks like somebody's hungry. I'd best get this spoiled puppy fed. Feel free to drop in any time you want. Ruth Weber, uh, the lady who is doing the voice of Nishanti here, you might recognize her from the Shiva, my previous game. She also played an Indian woman named Rajshree. And Ruth is not an Indian woman, in case you were wondering. It's just a, a coincidence. But in the Shiva, I had her do an accent. I had her do the Indian accent. And I learned my lesson. Not that Ruth was bad. Far from it. It's just uh, I felt that when I tell actors to do accents, they tend to focus a lot of their energy onto making sure the accent is right than into actually acting. And I decided here that Nishanti would not have an Indian accent. And I kind of... Um, wrote the character as someone who was very Americanized all of her life and then later when she got to be older decided to reconnect with her Indian roots uh, so if she didn't have the accent it was fine and if there were some Indian culture things that I got wrong it was okay because Nashanti isn't an expert on Indian culture she's just kind of reconnecting with it uh, later in life. So she wears the sari, she plays the instrument, she's got some Indian decorations, but if it's not totally accurate, it's okay. So that was kind of an easy out, easy back door for myself. I'll think about it. No thinking needed. I know we New Yorkers don't usually talk to our neighbors, but who cares? With this game, there is one thing I really wanted to get right above all things uh it was to get the new york lifestyle the new york attitude the new york uh, scene um across well to you guys um i really wanted to show off the city uh, not just the architecture it's beautiful parts of it are beautiful but also just the attitude um rosa is a very new york ish character and what nishanti says here is very very true generally we don't talk to our neighbors i guess you can analyze it in, in many different ways but um if if you know, if if you're out there on the other side of the world, you know, from if you're uh, Europe, Asia, you know, um, India, you know, Africa, wherever you might be playing this game, if if you got a little taste of what New York was like through this game, then um, I was successful. I did what I really wanted to do. The city can be a lonely place, especially when you live alone. I've got Moti. Who do you have? Oh. I have three great roommates. Oh? Yes. Um, their names are me, myself, and I. Um, it's a joke. Yeah, I get it. Very funny. I'm sure you're fine. Although your episode in the park tells me otherwise. And your eyes. Well, let's just say the offer stands. Sure. You go home now. We'll see each other soon, Rosangela, I'm sure. Hey. Yes? Um, you can call me Rosa, if you like. Rosangela's kind of a mouthful, you know? That little cheesy grin is perfect. Perfect. I, I got that from Ian one day, and I just started placing it everywhere I could, because uh, it captures this perfect combination of, like, awkwardness, and confusion and like trying to uh, I you can't quite explain it it's this like I don't know how to react so I'm just gonna smile awkwardly at you and I, I just I like it it really works out Joey has something very similar this really charming cheesy grin that I just kind of snuck in wherever wherever I could so uh, and the beta testers actually um, before uh, I implemented Rose's smile they would always remark how Rose seemed very cold and very harsh then I would stick that little smile in there and suddenly they, they changed their minds so uh, it's the magic of smiling people it's a, it's a lesson we all should adhere to all right Rosa this wasn't my intention when I originally wrote this line five years ago, but it sort of started a, a character trait or a character trend, is that when she, uh, whenever she meets someone, it's always, Hi, I'm Rosangela. 
if she likes you, she'll say, call me Rosa. And that is the case with all the future Blackwell games. With um, Claude, she felt comfortable with Claude, so she said, call me Rosa. Um, she said, call me Rosa to Jeremy in Blackwell Deception. Uh, so that has become a, a very Rosa thing to do. Uh, when she likes you or she's comfortable with you, she'll say, call me Rosa. Otherwise, it's Rosangela all the way. You have a good day now. What a strange lady. I'm not knocking on some stranger's door. One of the original background artists for this game, uh, this is like full disclosure now, it's five years later, statute of limitations, whatever. Um, he kind of disappeared like three quarters of the way through the production process. And it kind of left me high and dry. And at that time, I, I was determined to get this done. I was so determined. I had gambled everything, all my savings. I was like not sleeping half the time. I was pretty insane. I'll talk more about that later, but I was pretty insane. Like I was come hell or high water. I was going to be damned if I was not going to get this game out on the day that I said I was going to get it out. And um, this background artist who left, I think, almost all of the backgrounds in various stages of completion. So nothing was actually finished. And with like a month and a half to go, disappeared, gone, uh, left no address uh, or anything. And I had to really scramble. I burned through about like four or five other artists uh, to, to finish this. And um, it, that's the main reason why in the original version of this game, there are not that many hotspot descriptions. I talked about that before, how I decided to go back and add more of them. And I was able to do that by bringing Rebecca in to re-record uh, the lines. So uh, it's just interesting now how I always had to scrabble for artists back then. And I don't really have to do that anymore. So it's interesting to see how that's changed over time. Home. Thank God. I've never been so happy to see a 500 square foot room in my life. This room, strangely enough, uh, is one of the most frequently seen rooms in the game. But it was the last one drawn. And um, when Tom Scary, the background artist, he sent this to me, I'm just like, it's pink. And I have to admit, I never really thought much about uh, what Rose's apartment should look like. I always kind of imagined it as being very, just very bare with lots of books and not a lot of personality. And the fact that he made the wall so colorful, he made it a lot more colorful than I kind of imagined that they should be. But I look at it now, and I kind of like it. Because I, I think that it, it's very important to establish Rose's home as like her sanctuary. And it has to be comfortable. It has to be a place that you'd want to return to. Otherwise, you know, she wouldn't want to be there all the time. And that kind of makes sense. And the fact that it's pink is kind of nice. Because it, it gives Rosa a, a little bit more of a feminine quality, which she didn't really have before. Because um, she, she's so standoffish that you don't really get a sense of her personality most of the time. So it's nice that she has you know, this this colorful apartment that kind of shows a little bit more of her. And I thought that was very effective. So nice, uh, nice call, Tom Scary. Ugh. Griff is fine where he is. I don't need to bother. I don't get reception anyway. One of the beta testers when seeing this for the first time was like, how come her TV doesn't have any reception? That, that there's, uh, I don't see the point. Um, you know, this is a, a New York thing. Uh, maybe those of you outside of New York don't get this, but um, I don't know. It seems that most of the people I know, as a rule, don't watch a lot of TV. Maybe it's just the people I hang out with. We like to watch movies. Uh, I know me personally. I've got a, a TV. I have a nice TV. I get zero reception, but I have a DVD player, and I like to watch movies. And that's how I live. And several people I know uh, live the exact same way. So this kind of lifestyle really isn't that unusual. They're fine where they are. Hello? This is Dr. Quentin from Bellevue Hospital. Yes. 
I was your aunt's primary care physician. Did you receive my letter? Yes, I received it. I haven't had the time to come by, though. That's all right. I'm sure you're busy. However, should you find the time today, my entire schedule is free. I... sure. I I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Good day. If I don't visit him, he's just going to keep bothering me. I suppose I should just get it over with. I don't need to take the trash out. It's not even full. I'm not ready for bed. You just saw the lights flickering on and off. Originally, uh, I had wanted to do that to kind of establish that the lights in this hospital were a little bit faulty so the guard wouldn't get so crazy suspicious later on when the lights totally went, uh, went off. And originally, uh, this room had the lights flickering randomly as you wandered around, and I kind of liked that, although I realized when I started getting more graphical elements in, the door opens and shut, you know, the guard fiddling with the, with the antenna and, and all this stuff, that it just got to be uh, much more complicated than I had originally wanted it to be, because the lights, light levels wouldn't match. Um, I do an animation for you know the door opening, but the door opening would be for the you know the lit room, and then the guard animating for the uh, the radio. You know that was also for the for the lit version of the room, and switching back and forth, you know it just got way too complicated. And eventually I decided, eh, forget it. I'll just have the lights flicker when the elevator doors open and shut. And in a way that kind of makes sense because I used to have a printer actually, that every time you printed something, the lights in my apartment would get dangerously dim and start flickering on and off. So this isn't entirely out of, out of laziness. You can logically justify it. So uh, I hope I can be forgiven. I'm not stealing stuff from the hospital. I don't think so. What's with the lights? Hey, old buildings, you know? Always got problems. If the plumbing ain't broken, the lights are on the blink. It's giving me a headache, let me tell you. I'm here to see Dr. Quentin. Uh-huh. Is he expecting you? I've got this letter right here. Okay, looks legit. Go right in. His name's on the door, you can't miss it. Francisco Gonzalez, you might recognize from uh, Shiva. Uh, he did the voice of the detective in Shiva, and now he plays another sort of law enforcement guy. He plays the, the, the hospital rent-a-cop. Um, and he was very patient. Francisco was very, very patient with me because I kind of waited until like the uh, very, very end to send in the script because I wanted to, to kind of make sure I had everything um, in place in the, uh, in the script Bible. And of course, as I... As, being disorganized, I had left, you know, about six or seven lines out of it, and I would email him in a panic and be like, "Hey, here's hey, hey, the lines," and so he would he would dutifully send them back. Like by the next day, he'd re-record, and he did a great job. He's easy to work with. He does great work, and he writes great games too. He has a, a series of games called Ben Jordan Paranormal Investigator. Um, he go under uh, he goes under the name Grundislav Games. He calls himself Grundislav uh, on the internet. Um, I think he's up to number six or five or seven. Uh, in the series. He's so prolific, it's very hard to keep track. So, uh, Ben Jordan, Francisco Gonzalez, Grandislav Games. Check him out. Thanks. Come in. Dr. Quentin? Yes? I'm Rose Angela Blackwell. Oh, hello. Come in, come in. Uh, Dr. Quentin, who I now should call Dr. Backstory or Dr. Exposition. Uh, again, another uh, what was I thinking and apology moment. Rosa has a very complicated backstory. She's got her aunt and grandmother and all that stuff, and that needed to be related to the player in some way. And uh, I did that through this doctor and the letters later. I'll talk about those letters later. Um, and I think this was a really bad way of handling it. The one thing I've learned over five years of making these games is that info dumps, especially big info dumps like this, 
are bad. Uh, number one, they're boring, especially in an adventure game like this, because the characters don't move or do anything. So having all that informa information being thrown at you when there's nothing interesting to capture your attention, it's just it's just bad bad design. And also, so much information is being thrown at you uh, during this very boring thing. So you're not processing you're not processing it very well, uh, and you you miss it all. So if I could redo things, if I could be George Lucas, which I'm not going to do, uh, I would have figured out a way to parcel all this information out a little better over the course of the game. So uh, the player could have processed it better, um, which I didn't do five years ago when I made this game. I have learned since then. I make a point of not doing this uh, now when I make games. Uh, again, my first game, I apologize. You got my letter, I trust? Yes, I did. Good, good. My condolences on the loss of your mother. You might recognize uh, the voice of the doctor as the same guy who did the voice of Rabbi Zelig in the Shiva. And the guy behind the voice, his name is Joe Rodriguez, and I know him from my improv group. And Joe is such a funny, funny, funny guy. Um, man, this guy, he's just, he's so funny. I can't even explain how. He's just really funny. Um, but he's got this great uh, baritone, as you can as you can hear. And uh, I wanted the doctor to have this kind of very calm... Uh, maybe even slightly clinical but deep voice, and I knew Joe would be perfect. And so um, he lives kind of far away from me, uh, very far. He lives in Connecticut. I live in New York, and so uh, I knew he'd be perfect. And but I know he actually has professional equipment in his house, so he could do all the voices from his house. And he is such a good actor. I didn't have to worry about having to constantly be on hand to direct him. So I was willing to kind of let him let him do his own thing. And if I really wanted something to change, I I would uh, tell him. But uh, I never had to ask him to change anything because uh, everything was everything was perfect. Joe could nail it every single time without any direction. So yay, Joe! Joe is awesome. And uh, if Joe does not make it in the world of voice actoring, then uh, that's a crime. That's a big crime. So best of luck, Joe. Thanks, but she was my aunt, not my mother. Ah, quite right, quite right. So you wanted to talk to me about something? Yes, yes I did. But before we go into that, how are you holding up? I'm fine. Why? Oh, no reason. Just asking questions. Goes with the job. Right. You received the ashes? Yes, I scattered them this morning. I imagine you must miss her. To be honest, I'm not sure what to feel. It's not like I knew her, or even remember her from before. She's like a stranger. So why did you make it a point of visiting her all those years? She was the only family I had. I guess I felt an obligation like I had to. And now that you don't have to? Rosa is not sappy about her family. She's very realistic. She kind of pushes those feelings away. And a lot of the beta testers noted the fact. They said, hey, Rosa is such a bitch about her aunt. I mean, holy crap. She's just so mean. And this was totally done on purpose. She doesn't always necessarily think what she says. Uh, the doctor is trying to invade her personal space and she kind of retaliates by uh, saying this really nasty stuff and uh, she knows it's nasty and she's really just trying to get a reaction out of him. It's just this very neurotic thing that she's doing. Because Rosa does care. Uh, she visited her aunt every week. You'll see later on she asks Joey many questions about her aunt. Uh, she wants to know about her. She wants to know about her family. But up until now, um, it was something that was always denied to her. So she's always very realistic and doesn't like to dwell on those feelings because nothing would ever come of them. So she kind of just shoved it away and uh, pretended that it didn't bother her. So that's really uh, the essence of who Rosa is at this moment in time. And if she does act like a bit of an ice queen, that's totally on purpose. What do you want me to say? Auntie's dead. Life goes on. So you'll just keep living, is that it? Yes. Keep writing your little book reviews in the paper, right? You know about those? It's hardly a secret. A number of the staff have read them, yes. I didn't think a West Village paper would interest anyone up here. I have to be honest, Miss Blackwell. The staff read them because they were more interested in you. 
Okay, I am this close to leaving. Why am I here? Their intentions were purely benign, I assure you. It was your aunt they were primarily interested in. They wanted to know more about her family, and you proved to be, hmm, shall we say, less than eager to comply? That's their problem. Indeed. It was your choice to make. Your aunt was an interesting case. And now that she's gone, I was hoping you'd be more forthcoming with me. Just an informal chat. We can discuss her condition. And yours too, of course. The music here, if you pay attention, is a very subtle ticking noise. And I was told later on that it was it's a cool noise, but it was also a reference to the original... A very subtle reference to the original Bestowers of Eternity, where uh, you had to do a really, really awful puzzle, and for that I'm sorry, involving a stopwatch, uh, involving a stopwatch with an alarm clock. You had to... Uh, I'm going to give away the puzzle here, because it was... Um, it was so bad that I'm not, it's not giving anything away, where you had to lie down on the doctor's couch and he hypnotized you, and he would leave the room. And uh, in order to wake up while the doctor was still out, you'd have to set your stopwatch to wake you up while the doctor was out. It was a really horrible puzzle, and I did not include that in this game, uh, not by a long shot. It was so awful. Um, you know, I'm sorry about that. I really am sorry about that original horrible puzzle. I like to pretend the original bestowers never existed. <laughs> I have to be totally honest. A lot of people tell me that it was the best thing I did, and God, I, I hope not. I, I really hope not. I look at that now, and I just wince. Uh, I hope I managed to redeem myself with... Uh, with the Blackwell legacy. That's another reason why I changed the title. I just don't want to be associated with Bestowers of Eternity anymore. But anyway, yeah, the music, clock ticking, reference, uh, yeah. You never could find out what was wrong with her, huh? No, we didn't. But she still remains a fascinating case. Fascinating? I don't understand. Forgive me, I speak from a purely professional perspective. I didn't know your aunt personally. Neither did I, but fascinating? It might come as a surprise to you, but yes. But she was practically catatonic. All she did was lie there for 20 years. She'd sometimes twitch or mumble something incoherent, but I wouldn't call that fascinating. Well, as you know, she wasn't exactly catatonic. We kept her sedated. Right, she had outbursts. Yes, and we had to sedate her heavily to keep her calm especially in preparation for your visits. What are you trying to say? Miss Blackwell, we are not a nursing home. We're not content to merely keep a patient comfortable. We are, after all, in the healing profession. We were trying to heal your aunt, and to do that, we had to speak to her. Wait, you spoke to auntie? We tried to. Did she answer back? After a fashion, yes. Wait, what do you mean by my condition? Hereditary dementia is my specialty, Miss Blackwell. And in my opinion, there is significant cause for concern. Sorry, did you say hereditary? Yes, two generations. Your aunt and your grandmother before her. My grandmother? Yes, Patricia, I think her name was, right? I never knew my grandmother. Auntie Lauren was it. There was nobody else. She couldn't exactly provide me with the family history. Oh, I see. I had no idea. Well, maybe you should have. Did anyone else come in to visit her besides me? No, you are correct. I should have read the family history more carefully. I do apologize. I just assumed... Well, never mind. It doesn't change the fact that you should be concerned as well. Go on. Patricia Blackwell suffered her mental collapse at the age of 55. Lauren Blackwell underwent hers at the age of 40. What are you saying? That the same thing is going to happen to me? No. I'm saying that there is significant cause for concern. If Auntie spoke, why wasn't I told? Miss Blackwell, do you remember what brought your aunt here in the first place? Her screaming? Her hitting herself? I was only five years old at the time, but I kind of remember. In order to prevent her from doing harm to herself or to others, we were forced to sedate her. When we limited her medication, she simply reverted to her former state. Her natural state, I'm sorry to add. What did Auntie say? Nothing that made any sense. But one thing was clear. She was in great pain. Pain? What kind of pain? It's difficult to say, but it was immense. How immense? When we reduced her medication, 
The transformation was dramatic. Her eyes flew open. She thrashed. Her screams. Well, we had to gag her eventually. My God. I know. Did she still feel it when she was sedated? We don't know. There's no way of knowing. 25 years. I know. Poor auntie. So, I had a grandmother. Apparently so. How do you know about her? It was in your aunt's case history when she was brought to us. Patricia Blackwell's symptoms were the same, word for word. Patricia's case was severe, and she was young, but it was chalked up to being an ordinary case of dementia. Until... Until it struck her daughter. Until 20 years later, when it struck her daughter, yes. It seems impossible. Perhaps it's genetic, but we've detected no abnormality. So what should I do? Right now, nothing. This type of thing is unprecedented. There is no procedure to go through, no medication I can give you. I just want you to be aware is all. And come talk to me if, well, there's any concern. You couldn't find any other link between the two cases? None, aside from the family connection. And uh, a name. A name? What name? The documentation we had on your grandmother is minimal, but there was one interesting item noted. During her more lucid moments, she uttered the name Joey. Your aunt, too, would cry out that name on occasion. Joey? Yes. Who's Joey? We've been wondering the same thing for 25 years. Is there anything else you need to tell me before I go? Your aunt had some personal effects in storage. As the next of kin, you're the beneficiary. It's just a folder, some documents and so on. It's being sent to your address via messenger. Oh, well, thanks for that. It's no problem at all. Goodbye, Miss Blackwell. My schedule is fairly open now, so feel free to drop in any time. I'm always happy to discuss my favorite patient. Sure. Did you have contact with Lauren Blackwell while she was here? Nope. Doesn't ring a bell. She was in uh, temporary care? No, she was in long term. That's a whole different floor. This is the floor for temp patients. I see. So what exactly happens here on the temporary ward? It's just that. Temporary. Most insurance plans only cover a two-week stay, so this floor is designed for a high turnover rate. That's why the doctor's offices are usually down here. They need to be on hand when the new patients arrive. Thanks. Uh-huh. Looks like it's from Bellevue. I guess I could talk a little bit more about the creation of this room. I mentioned earlier how Tom Scary drew the room, uh, which isn't entirely true. Chris Fimo actually uh, drew a lot of it as well. Tom Scary drew the basic outline. He did the um, the walls, the kitchen, the table, the, the shelf, the computer desk, and all that. And then Chris Fimo came along, and uh, after Tom Scary became too busy to finish, Chris Fimo added so many extra details. He kind of took what he knew about Rosa. He created that bulletin board for her newspaper clippings. He put the teddy bear up there, which is a reference to one of my earlier games. Uh, I kind of um, wanted that there. Uh, he added um, the bedroom behind the door. He added the plants, which I totally wasn't expecting. I never thought of Rosa as a, as a plant girl. So <laughs> I included a message saying they were fake. That's, that's more of a Rosa thing. Uh, he had all those books. 
Uh, he added the notebook there. Um, he added the couch and the table, uh, the end table. So I had to redo all the walkable areas. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. <laughs> but he really, uh, really helped make the room come alive. So uh, good job, man. When I created the original freeware uh, Bestowers of Eternity in 2002, uh, was it 2003? Gosh, it was a while ago. Anyway, um, people told me that the letters that Rosa reads was their favorite part of the game. Actually, that was it seemed to be the thing that made the game. Uh, I don't. I wonder if I didn't put those letters in there if people would have liked it so much. But um, I hope that the it's just as effective in Blackwell Legacy, even though I kind of moved the focus away from Rosa and her family to the case that Rosa is working on, if only because the backstory is now so much bigger and so much better that it's going to take a while to, to get to it. So I kind of wanted to give you a little taste of the backstory now, and then um, in the future you'll see more. So hopefully um, you're not kept in total suspense, but uh, in the meantime this is uh, a bit of Rosa, Rosangela Blackwell backstory that you get for now. I'm afraid this is another what was I thinking and I'm sorry moment. Uh, I don't know why I thought uh, making the player read through 25 pages of old letters was a good idea, but uh, apparently I did, and I can only <laughs> apologize for that. This was horrible design, and I'm being really overly critical with myself. Um, but, you know, I was f five years ago. It doesn't seem like that uh, huge amount of time, but I have, feel like I've learned a lot since then because I look at this now and I'm like, what? Why did I do that? And I thought about editing these letters down, uh, but in the end I kept them because I do like them. I think that uh, the story they tell is quite compelling, and if you go on to play the next game in the series, a lot of the things you learn in these letters come to play there. So I kept them, but if I, again, could do this all over, I would have uh, I would have done it a lot differently. You'll notice here that it's signed Jack and not Jacko. This was sort of my little way of showing that uh, Jack was growing up. This was his turning point. He's no longer Jacko. He's now Jack. He's a, This has changed his life. He's a totally different person, blah, blah, blah. It's a subtle thing, but uh, hopefully it got through to some people.
There are some pictures stuck to the back of this letter. Hello? Rosangelina, hi. Hi, Bob. Thanks so much for submitting your last review on time. For once. Yeah. I've got a little assignment for you today. Assignment? Human interest, Blackwell. Suicide. College girl named Joanne Sherman. That's awful, but... You know the Brittany house, the NYU dorm? Yes, but... Speak to some people on her floor. Get a word in with the roommate. Listen. Speak to the RA, too. And hey, see if you can score a picture of the girl. But I don't do that stuff. I write book reviews. Versatility. Time to get out of your comfort zone. Jeremy's over at City Hall covering that strike, so you are it. Get cracking. I have a blog, uh, like most people do these days. Uh, you can find it linked off of the Wajedai Games website. And there was an entry I wrote about a year and a half ago uh, where I talked about how I learned not to write such lengthy dialogues. And I used Blackwell Legacy as an example of when I wrote really lengthy dialogues. And I decided to take one of the dialogues from Blackwell Legacy, transcribe it, and uh, rewrite it. I said, this is how I would write it now. And I used this conversation between Rosa and her boss as the example. And the original conversation was about like 45 lines or something like that. It was really long. And it was even especially more boring because you don't see the other character, the other characters on the phone. And then in the blog, I edited it down to like maybe 16 lines instead. And I said, well, you know, I... Uh, this is how I would do this if I was redoing the game. And since I am redoing the game, I decided, well, why not use that revamp dialogue? So I did. So this is the one place I really edited heavily. Uh, there's other parts of the game where I cut lines, but this is the only place where I edited them. Uh, and I think it's a lot tighter and cleaner as a result. I hate him so much. Is freelancing for that stupid paper even worth it? Well, I guess it keeps me writing, but... Oh, whatever. I'll just go over there and get it done. It's not like I don't have enough death in my life right now. Maybe this isn't a bad thing. It's like being a real reporter. Sort of. My old notepad should come in handy for this. All right, new option on the menu. Uh, yeah, you just got the notebook. Um, one of the things people really seemed to like about the Shiva, uh, and they kind of praised me for being original, was the notebook, was the notes interface, the clues interface, how you'd use clues as, in, as inventory, and they praised how awesome and original that was. I want to deny this, because I feel that credit should be given to Discworld Noir. Uh, the third game in the Discworld series, which is a beautiful noir adventure, and it actually inspired me to create mystery adventure games. And the Discworld noir had clues as inventory. They did it first, not me. <laughs> so I want to give those guys credit. So just all that credit you're giving to me, give it to Discworld noir. They deserve it. That's definitely Auntie Lauren. She's looking at something off camera. I wonder what it was. I assume that's my mother. She sort of looks like me, I guess. Other than that, she's a total stranger. Is that my dad? He looks so young. I always pictured my dad as being older. There's nothing in these cabinets I want right now. Cook? Why bother when every Chinese restaurant in the area delivers?
Yes, I totally ripped off this line. I am an evil thief. Uh, you might remember a previous game of mine called Two of a Kind, where uh, Timothy Walters goes into this other person's kitchen and says, you know, why should I cook when every Chinese restaurant in town delivers? That's a very New York thing to say, so I, it seemed more appropriate to put it into this game. Um, and so uh, I, I made sure I was covered. I um, asked myself permission if it was okay if I copied from myself, and I thought about it, and then I said to myself, sure, yeah, it's okay, but I want it in writing. So I drafted up a letter and gave it to myself, and I signed it, and I signed it, and I filed it, and I gave a copy to myself, and I kept a copy for myself, and uh, so I'm covered. I'm covered. Uh, neither of us plans on suing the other, so we're all good. I don't need to touch it. I know these plants are fake. Ugh. I feel like hell and I have to interview college kids. Hopefully this won't take too long. Peter Gresser uh, did the music for this game and I figure this is a good time to talk about him because this is my favorite tune of the whole game, uh, the one that you will listen to in this room, this crazy electronica stuff. He did the music for Shiva. Um, and I think he really went all out with this game. He really kind of um, he made it more uni the music more unified and it's uh, really cool. It's this kind of very um, mystical electronica soundtrack, which I wasn't expecting. I was not expecting this electrical synth stuff. And I think it kind of works because it does kind of give you that feeling of uneasiness and something's kind of not right, which I, I kind of dug. And uh, Peter uh, is a great musician. You should check out his MySpace page. Um, I, I linked to it on the Wadjet Eye website. You can go there because I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, Peter Gresser, he's, he's really good. Um, if you ever need music, you should check him out. Um, no. There's nobody home. Hmm? Hi, I'm Rosangela Blackwell. Can I help you? Perhaps. Could I ask you a few questions? Oh, this is about Joanne, isn't it? You know her? Well, I am the RA for this floor. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't know everybody. The campus police found her around 5 a.m. this morning. Can you tell me about her? Hmm. Well, all right. But could you leave my name out of it? That shouldn't be a problem. Good. Joanne's parents have already asked the dean to fire me. I don't need anyone else knowing who I am. What do you want to know? Could you tell me about Joanne again? Well, as I said, I didn't know her socially, but she seemed nice enough. Nobody ever complained about her. She always had friends around her. She never had any trouble, as far as I know. Her suicide came as a total surprise. Can you tell me anything about Joanne? She jumped off the roof. She died instantly. It was in the middle of the night. There was, there was no way anybody could have stopped her. Make sure you print that. Would you have a picture of Joanne? A picture? No. Why would I? Just asking. So how did you get to be an RA of this floor? What do you mean? Well, it's a girl's floor and you, well... Aren't? Yes. Well, it's like this. Someone at the registrar thought Adrian was a girl's name. So here I am. None of the girls have complained? Not yet. They seem to prefer it. This sort of thing happens quite frequently. You'd be surprised. They really thought you were a girl? Yes. 
They really... Yeah. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for helping out. Just remember, leave my name out of it. It's funny listening to Roses agree not to use his name in the article because uh, I've forgotten all about that. And if you uh, play Blackwell Convergence, uh, the next game that stars Rosa, uh, the article that Rosa wrote is on her wall. And you can read it, and it says right there in the article, Adrian Tucker said that blah, 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 blah. And um, I didn't even... I realized this at the time, but it's just kind of funny that Rosa did end up using his name. So I guess she's not the most ethical of journalists. I'm not stealing stuff from college kids. There's nobody home. There's nobody home. Ew, there's gum stuck to the faucet. I'm not touching that. Yeah. I admit that this section I was a little worried about. You're suddenly told by a character you've never heard of to go to a location you've never been to and talk to characters that you've never heard of about the death of another character you've never heard of. So it was kind of, I was worried it was very sudden and very jarring to suddenly kind of shift gears entirely. And whenever this was beta tested, when I would would give it to a new beta tester, the first thing I would always ask them when they got uh, significantly far is, did this seem strange? Did this seem jarring? And no one seemed to mind. Uh, no one said anything. So I kind of took a step back and I said, okay, I guess it's fine. If these guys, these very these very strict anal beta testers, believe me, these guys are picky. Uh, if they didn't say anything, then I'd like to think it's okay. Hi, I'm Rosangela Blackwell. Am I supposed to know you? No, I'm with the Village Eye. The Village what? The Village Eye, the newspaper. I've never heard of it. It doesn't matter. Well, what do you want then? I'd like to talk to you about your roommate, if that's all right. Jesus Christ. I'm busy with midterms. I told the campus police everything. Do you have to bother me? Look, so she killed herself. Big whoop. Why is that my problem? I understand that this must be a difficult time for you. Difficult? Hell no. It's been great. You know how long I've been wanting my own room? You don't care? Not even a little bit? No, I don't. Why the hell should I? For that matter, why should you? Will you please calm down? Calm down? Who the hell do you think you are? I just want to know a little bit about Joanne. Fine. You want to know about Joanne? She's dead. She couldn't take the pressure, so she jumped off the roof. Did Joanne act unusual before she died? Nope. Same old Joanne. Studied at our desk all day and slept all night, as usual. Quiet as a little mouse. Is there anything else you can tell me about Joanne? No. Do you have any thoughts on why Joanne would kill herself? Nope. Just another kid who couldn't hack it. Do you have a photograph of Joanne that we could use for the newspaper? You want a what? Just a photograph. You'll get it right back. Yeah, right. You think I'm giving you anything? Think again. Can you tell me anything about Adrian? The RA? He's okay. He helps us out when we need it and keeps out of our way when we don't. It's the way it should be. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Why do you want to know? Just background info for the paper. I don't think so. Suit yourself. Joanne never had trouble sleeping. How would I know? You lived with her. Like I pay attention. So Joanne was a good student. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, sure. Whatever. There's nobody home. Hmm? Hi, it's me again. You have more questions, I imagine? Yeah, is that okay? I suppose so. What do you want to know? What can you tell me about Joanne's roommate? Kelly? Have you met her? Yes. 
quite a sight, huh? But don't judge her by that. She's the sharpest kid you'll ever meet. She gets straight A's on everything. Really? Yep, she's pre-med. Do you know if Joanne had any trouble sleeping? I'm afraid I wouldn't. Her roommate, Kelly, never complained, but that's not surprising. Why is that? Well, Kelly rarely spent the night in her room. She only comes here to study, as far as I've seen. I prided myself on hiring actors for most every role in this game, but the guy playing Adrian here, his name is Thomas Tucker, he is the only professional voice actor. And you can tell just by listening to him. You will hear no breath pops. You will hear everything is pitch perfect. Uh, he kind of sat down and did it and knew exactly how to breathe. And I actually, um, I probably, uh, and if obviously I'm thinking of doing this, and by the time this is released, if I decided to, I would have already have done it. Um, having his uh, voice over um, the raw uh, voiceover footage, I don't know if you can call it footage, but yeah, all that available for people to listen to because I think um, for, for games especially people don't know how to direct voice actors and I'm, I'm learning uh, I'm not very I've learned a lot through the process but I'm still learning and there's so much to do with breathing and breathing in the right spot and uh, Thomas was really good about that he would whenever he would say a line he would just go and hold in the breath and then say the line and then he would breathe like he would just be so aware of his breathing because it sounds really ugly when you don't breathe correctly and I know that I um, did, wasn't always successful in getting the actors to breathe correctly uh, throughout the course of this game. So uh, Thomas was awesome. And uh, you could tell it's a shame he got one of the smallest roles in the game. If Had I known he, he was such a pro, I would have given him a larger role. Um, I wouldn't have given him Joey because cause Abe's Joey, but I would have given him uh, someone, somebody else. Uh, but definitely, uh, we'll look, watch out for Thomas in future games because he's definitely going to stick around. Because uh, when you find a good thing, you, you don't get rid of it. So, uh, yeah. Was Joanne a good student? I don't think she had any problems, but of course, the pressure can get to anybody. Do you know where Kelly was sleeping? No, it's not my place to ask. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for helping out. Just remember, leave my name out of it. So, you've been sleeping somewhere else lately? Yeah, I've been at my boyfriend's. You've been following me or something? No, no, just confirming the information. Looks like Adrian's been talking. Joanne never had trouble sleeping. How would I know? You lived with her. Like I pay attention. So Joanne was a good student? Yeah, sure. Whatever. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Why do you- Just background- I don't think so. Suit yourself. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Hmm? Hi, it's me again. You have more questions? Yeah, is that okay? I suppose so. What do you want to know? Do you know where Kelly was sleeping? No, it's not my place to ask. Do you know if Joanne had any trouble sleeping? As I All I know is that, but since... Was Joanne a good student? I don't think she had any problem, but of course... Can you tell me anything else about Kelly? I don't feel it's my place to say anything else. If you want to know more, we'll have to ask her. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for helping out. Just remember, leave my name out of it.
Wait a minute. Something isn't right. If Kelly's been spending her night somewhere else, how can she know if her roommate was sleeping well or not? Hmm. I think Kelly was lying to me. This notebook thing has become a, a Blackwell staple since it was introduced here. Um, it has its drawbacks, uh, unfortunately. The major problem with it, and it's took, taken me a while and I still haven't quite worked out the kinks four games later. The biggest problem with it is that um, it's not a very intuitive way to, um, to go through a game. Uh, you make a connection in your head. And you just naturally assume that the character on screen has made that same connection. But no, you have to go into that notebook interface, connect the clues there in order for the character you're playing to make the same connection. And inevitably, uh, with every single Black Hole game that has this interface, um, the places where people get stuck are the places where you have to combine clues. Without fail, that's where people inevitably get stuck. If they get stuck, it's there. And um, it's funny. So when I got to Blackwell Convergence, the third game in the series, I decided to remove the clues interface completely. And there was a bit of a backlash. Uh, people really missed having being able to combine clues. Uh, it was really surprising because I just thought the system was so broken, but people really missed it. So for Blackwell Deception, the fourth game in the series, I, I brought it back and I... I kind of fine-tuned it a bit, so it's a little bit more intuitive to use. It still has some problems, but I, I do like the system because it's a very, uh, it, it's really appropriate for a mystery game. Uh, rather than having to use inventory on stuff, you're using clues and information. So for a mystery type game, it works really well. Uh, it's not terribly intuitive, even after four games of, of using it, but uh, I still think it, it works really well in terms of solving a mystery. Your RA told me that you haven't been sleeping in your dorm. Yes, so? You told me that Joanne slept in her room every night. So? How would you know Joanne slept here if you've been sleeping somewhere else? Huh? Oh, well, I just assumed. Did you lie to me? I didn't lie. I just... Oh, screw it. You want to talk? Fine. What do you want to know? So what was Joanne really like? To be honest? There's nothing to say. She was studying political science, which is kind of cool, I guess. But she was so vanilla. Vanilla? You know, sweet, but not much there. Just a typical college kid. Acted just like everybody else. She seemed proud of it. Did Joanne act unusual before she died? Well, no. Although, the last few weeks, she's been talking in her sleep. What did she say? No idea. Couldn't understand her. She swore up and down that she wasn't doing it. She looked a bit scared, though. Scared? How so? Just scared. I didn't need the drama, so I've been sleeping at my boyfriend's place. So you weren't here when she... Killed herself? No, I wasn't here. N not that it would have made much of a difference. Are we done? Can you tell me anything about Adrian? The RA? He's okay. He helps us out when we need it, and keeps out of our way when we don't. It's the way it should be. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Why do you want to know? Just background info for the paper. I don't think so. Suit yourself. I could really use a photo of Joanne, if you have one. Hmm. All right. Just a sec. This was hers. It was on her desk. She won't be needing it anymore. Joanne's the girl on the left. You might have heard me earlier say that I, I don't like accents. Um, or rather, I prefer not to work with them. But uh, the girl playing... Kelly here. Her name is Chen Young Shu. Uh, she's a really versatile actress. Uh, she originally had her in mind for the role of Allie, which is the sad, lonely ghost that you'll see later on. And uh, I hope you've played through the game already, because uh, that's not the only thing I'm going to be giving away. But um, I said to Chen, I said, hey, you know, you're perfect for Allie. Uh, I know you can do that, but it's such a small role, and I just felt like I was wasting her. Uh, and I said, hey, how do you feel about doing two characters? And I gave her the script for Allie, and she read it. And kind of as a joke, at one point, she read it in that in this tough Brooklyn's Queens accent. And I said, hey, that's, that's awesome. Let's do it that way. Because I, th I figured with the accent, it would really differentiate between the two roles. 
And admittedly, you know, my experience with accents has not been great. Uh, as I said earlier, people tend to focus more on getting the accent right than into acting. And uh, I had the same problem here. And I, uh, this is no fault of Chen's. She originally did not really want to do the accent. Uh, she was originally trying to go for this kind of goth girl thing, but I'm like, no, do the accent. I kind of really insist on it because I wanted the two characters to be, to sound different. And so I, I insisted to do the accent, but don't put too much effort into it. Just kind of make it there. Like, don't really, don't worry about being authentic. It's just like, just kind of let it come, but speak naturally. And I think it did a good job. I, and I put the two voices together just as a test, and they sound pretty different. And the characters are so different that uh, I don't think people, the beta testers didn't seem to mind. No one seemed to mind. So uh, I think it worked. So um, yeah, if anyone needs a lady voice actress, uh, get in touch with me. I'll, I'll get you in touch with Chen because uh, she's awesome. Thanks. It's funny listening to that character, Kelly, now, because uh, back then in the dark ages of 2006, I was very new to everything. I was new to VO recording, and I didn't even think about breath pops. And breath pops meaning stuff like this, when you uh, talk too close to the mic and your breath ruins stuff you say. Uh, I never thought about that. I never thought about trying to uh, avoid them or even minimizing them or editing them out uh, in post-production. I didn't do any of that. And so uh, I, I just left them all in. And I just now, after five years and like eight or nine games of, of doing VO, I've become a lot more skilled in listening for breath pops during recording and removing them in post. Um, but now listening to all this, I think Kelly is a particularly bad offender. And later, I think the Deacon also uh, breathes a lot <laughs> into the mic. Uh, if, if only actors didn't need to breathe, things would be so much easier. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, sure. Whatever. I don't want to ruin the picture. I don't want to ruin the picture. Ugh. This is getting worse. At least I have enough for the story now. I'd better get home. If you play the original uh, version of this game, you might have noticed one small change is that the fonts look a little different. And it was a, a quirk of the old version of the engine. The The game was uh, it's 320 by 240 resolution, which might seem small, and it is, but the engine can you know double, triple the, uh, the graphics uh, up to fit uh, your monitor. Um, but back then... You were, there was this trick where you could uh, trick the engine into displaying high-resolution fonts even in a low-resolution game. Uh, so I was able to have nice-looking fonts uh, for most of the dialogue and, and everything in the game. Uh, unfortunately, that, um, that loophole, that trick, no longer works in the current version of Adventure Game Studio. So I had to go with each of the three games, um, which all used high-res fonts, I had to go and find low-resolution fonts uh, for everything, and which kind of seemed weird. For an upgrade, I had to downgrade all the fonts, and it's a little disappointing because they're not as nice and, and crisp and clear as they used to be, but there was no way around it. There was absolutely no way to display high-res fonts in a low-res game uh, in the newest version of AGS, so um, sorry about that. There's nothing that could be done. This is getting bad. <laughs> oh my god. This really hurts. Sleep, that's all I need. I'll just type up the story and get to bed. Shouldn't take that long. Right. No more interruptions. Done. Articles finished, picture is scanned, and I am done for the day. No. What? I need fresh air. I've got to get out of here.
It's a photograph of Auntie Lauren and me. Come in! Hello, Rosa. Come in, come in. Don't mind the pooch, he's harmless. I, I often make a big thing about how I'm more professional with VO recording now, because I used to have this headset mic that I just gave the actors, um, but now I have a Blue Yeti USB mic, and it's all professional, and the sound quality is so much better, and the actors can, can stand up and project, and uh, i all professional and stuff with my VO recording. But when Rebecca was recording uh, Rosa, there was this one session where um, the Occupy Wall Street folks decided to march past my window. <laughs> And normally my apartment's pretty quiet, but not that day. Uh, so occasionally, if you are wearing headphones and have the volume up really high, you might be able to hear while Rose is talking the sound of sirens or bullhorns or, or things like that. Uh, so, you know, I'm not as professional as, I, as I'd like to be sometimes. All right, but this is the last one. Go get it. I mentioned earlier that I looked after a dog, my friend's dog, for a week and I took the dog to Washington Square Park. That dog was a Boston Terrier and that dog's name was Cooper and the, the owner's name was Sarah. And I really based Nishanti's relationship with Moti, which means pearl in Hindi by the way, I based that relationship on Sarah's relationship with Cooper. And uh, I love Boston Terriers. Ever since I looked after Cooper, I just become obsessed with these little squishy nose guys. And everything, all the little tricks that Modi does here, Cooper does the exact same thing. The whole go get it thing. Uh, Sarah did the exact same thing. She'd hold out the treat, the dog would beg, and she'd say, go get it. And the dog would just snap the treat right up. So I, I totally based that on, on Cooper. And, uh, you know, man, you know, people and their dogs. I happen to be allergic, so I, I cannot actually own a dog permanently. But that's all right. Allergies won't stop me from putting a, a dog in a game. So I can live vicariously through my games and, and have a dog that way. Not quite like the real thing, but it's the closest I'm ever going to get. Hey, boy. Hi, um, dog. His name is Moti. Right, Moti. See ya. This is, um, a lovely place. Thank you. Not the biggest place, but fine for Moti and me. Thanks again for helping me out earlier. I'd probably be sleeping in a hotel tonight if it weren't for you. Oh, didn't you hear? The strike's over. Really? It only lasted a few hours according to the report on the radio. I suppose that's irony. I suppose so. I think this line might have been a little too subtle. There was a bit of, um subtext there that I'm not sure if people got or not, but basically if it wasn't for the strike, Nashanti and Rosa would never have met. And so when Rosa gets all in a huff about the strike being over so soon, uh, Nashanti's a tiny little bit insulted, even though it's, um, she knows it's totally unintentional, it was totally an innocent thing to say, but she's a little bit insulted. And it's extremely subtle, and I don't know if anyone picked up on it or not, but that's what this commentary is for, so uh, lucky you. So, you play the flute, huh? Yes, I play the flute. It's called a bansuri. What about you? Do you play an instrument? Me? No, I can hardly play the kazoo. Let's see. You strike me as being creatively inclined. Are you a painter? A writer. Well, I'm trying to be a writer. I knew it. A problem with a lot of Nishanti's lines here is that it's just straight information giving without a lot of character. And when Ruth read the lines, we found it very difficult to give it some give it something. And so we kind of talked about ways to give each line some subtext. And I, I'm giving this information to you in advance, so you'll be ready. Uh, they're about to talk about uh, the newspaper that Rosa works for. And I told Ruth, I said, hey, you know, Ruth, uh, the character Nishanti, she's going to say, oh, I've never actually read it, but maybe I will. 
I said to Ruth, I said, hey, you know what? You actually have read these newspapers, and you use them to house train your dog. So you feel guilty about it. And so that's how she read the line. And, you know, it's not something that anyone would get. There's no way you would get that. But you'll definitely notice that there's a little bit more character to the line than there would have been otherwise. So it was a little little trick that we that we did to make the lines a little sound a little more interesting. Anything published? Nothing really, aside from book reviews in the Village Eye. Village Eye? You mean that little paper they sell at the stand? You've read it? I've seen it around, but I've never actually read it. Perhaps I will the next time I see it. That dog is adorable. Moti? He's spoiled rotten, but he's good company. He's taken quite a shine to you, that's for sure. Huh. Yeah. Usually I'm not good with animals. You never had a childhood pet? A pet? No, I had a teddy bear. <laughs> well, you probably had the right idea. Moti's a little thing, but you wouldn't know it from the amount he eats. There's a game called The Longest Journey, which is critically acclaimed, but uh, it's a great game, you should all play it. But one common complaint, and a complaint I have, is that you could spend hours talking to the peripheral characters. And it's not so much that there's a lot of dialogue, nothing wrong with a lot of dialogue, but it's just that the dialogue itself, uh, like you could spend an hour talking to the main character whose name is April. You could speak, spend an hour talking to April's landlady, learn the landlady's life story and you'd never see the landlady again. None of that information moves the story along. And I found myself doing the same thing with Nishanti here. It was very tempting to delve into Nishanti's life story and learn everything about her. And I held myself back, but what I decided to do instead, uh, to kind of justify long dialogues with Nishanti, because I think she's a cool character, was to um, spin everything you ask Nishanti into learning something about Rosangela. You'll see in this dialogue how um, you, you're talking about Nishanti's pet, and then Nishanti asks Rosa a question back. Hey, did you have a pet? And so you learn that Rosangela never had a pet. She grew up with a teddy bear. Uh, so in learning about Nishanti, it actually moves the story along a bit because you learn more about Rosa, the character you're playing. So that was sort of my, my wacky, crazy plan when, uh, when writing these dialogues. He's very active, it seems. Yes, that probably explains it. See that box of biscuits? I buy a new one every two days. Moti doesn't have a stomach. He has a black hole that sucks in food. Feel free to give him one if you like. You have a very nice apartment. Thank you. A bit small, but that's New York for you. You seem very friendly with the people in this building. Well, I didn't grow up here. I didn't realize it was taboo to chat with neighbors. Well, it's not taboo exactly, it's just... Oh, I know, just one of those unspoken things. I've found that most people are pretty friendly, though, once you take the first step. People have their defenses up most of the time. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do. Why do you play the flute in the park? It's a place to go, I suppose. I was walking there one day and I had the Bansuri with me, so I started playing. Next thing I knew, I had a bunch of people around me. So I go there as often as I can now. It gets me out of this stuffy apartment, and I admit I like the attention. Plus, Moti loves the dog run there. Well, he did until they closed it down. Why did they close down the dog run? It seemed okay to me. Nobody really knows. It started about a week ago. Dogs started howling, running around like maniacs, acting strange. Some even hurled themselves at the fence door trying to get out. They say it's some kind of high frequency wave that's caused by electric cables or something. Some high-pitched sound that the dogs can hear, but we can't. But I know better. You know better? Definitely. I noticed these things. I could tell that things weren't quite right. Something in the air. It's not a high-pitched noise. That would only cause a dog pain. This was more than pain. The dogs were scared. What was there to be scared of? I have no idea, but I know what I sensed, just like you did. Me? You sensed it. Don't think I didn't notice. I didn't sense anything. Well, perhaps. Maybe I'm just spouting nonsense. Could I try feeding the dog? Sure, here, take one. I have plenty. Go ahead and feed him. He's always hungry. Well, I'd better go. Take care, Rosa. Come back whenever you'd like.
some. Go get it. I mentioned earlier that I looked after a dog, my friend's dog, for a week, and I took the dog to Washington Square Park. That dog was a Boston Terrier, and that dog's name was Cooper, and the, the owner's name was Sarah. And I really based Nishanti's relationship with Moti, which means pearl in Hindi, by the way, I based that relationship on Sarah's relationship with Cooper. And uh, I love Boston Terriers. Ever since I looked after Cooper, I just become obsessed with these little squishy nose guys. And everything, all the little tricks that Modi does here, Cooper does the exact same thing. The whole go get it thing. Uh, Sarah did the exact same thing. She'd hold out the treat, the dog would beg, and she'd say, go get it. And the dog would just snap the treat right up. So I, I totally based that on, on Cooper. And, uh, you know, man, you know, people and their dogs. I happen to be allergic, so I, I cannot actually own a dog permanently. But that's all right. Allergies won't stop me from putting a, a dog in a game. So I can live vicariously through my games and, and have a dog that way. Not quite like the real thing, but it's the closest I'm ever going to get. What? is happening. It's gone. The pain. It's gone. That was strange. It was like... like... What is that? The photo. Something is different about it. I almost don't want to look, but... No, no, no! I did not just see that. I am not going crazy. No, it's just the stress, that's all. Auntie's death, work, life... I just need a rest, that's all. do that joey can certainly make an entrance the uh, of course the man behind the ghost his name is abe goldfarb you might remember him from uh, from shiva he did the voice of rabbi stone in the shiva and joey is of course a much different character than rabbi stone uh, it actually took abe a little while to kind of get the hold of joey get the hang of it um, he tended to drift into rabbi mode occasionally and actually when he finally nailed the character he wanted to start over and do it all again because he that's how professional Abe is. He really wanted it to be to be good. I always count myself very lucky that one of my closest friends is also one of the, the best actors I know. Uh, there's actually this kind of running joke in terms of voice acting in games where they always say how the developers hired their friends and relatives to do the voices. Um, and that's exactly what I did. But fortunately, my friend can, can actually act. So uh, working with Abe is always a blast because um, he's just a lot of fun. He's very funny. You listen to the bloopers at the end and, and you'll see. Um, but he also has very good instincts when it comes to uh, reading. Uh, he requires very little direction, and sometimes he would make very good suggestions. And and most of them, I would say, uh, <laughs> 75 to 90 percent of his suggestions, I would actually take. So uh, Abe always makes every project shine. So Griff, long time no see. How's tricks? Right, thought as much. Blackwell dames. Always sleeping. You're always sleeping, and I'm always watching. Yep, that's me. The eternal chump. Mm. It's about time. Hey, nap time Nelly. Wake up. What? <clears throat> Shall we try this again? No. Now that's not very polite. Go away. I'm afraid I can't do that, darling. Believe me, I've tried. No. You don't exist. Oh, yes, I do. Look at me. This is not happening. This is not happening. Oh, brother. I am not going insane. There is nothing there. Could you? No. I am not my aunt. I am not my grandmother. I am not going to end up like that. Listen. Get out of my head. 
There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Could you? Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. No, you shut up. You're going to listen. And you're going to listen good. I've been watching you all day, sweetheart. You know who I am. No. Yes. I'm not going away, so there'd be no point in beating around the bush. Now say my name. No! Damn you, you know my name, now say it! You're... Yes? You're... Joey? Good girl. You got it in one. Now turn around and look at me. I... Don't worry. I won't bite. Couldn't even if I wanted to. Hi there. Um... You really exist. Oh yes. Live and in person. Although I'm not really alive. And I'm not sure if I can still call myself a person anymore. So who are you? I'm Joey Malone. And I'm the family spirit guide. What? Think of me as the Blackwell legacy, darling. I'm passed down from one generation to the next. Like a family heirloom. First your grandmother got stuck with me. Then your aunt. And now you. Where did you come from? That's a long, long story, Dollface. And we've got more important things to do. Why have you been haunting my family? Haunting? Is that what I'm doing? That's a real ugly word. Answer me, why are you here? You got me, sweetheart. I've been wondering why me and why your family since this whole gig started. Must be some kind of gift your family has. A gift? You're a medium. A medium with a direct connection with the spirit world. And I, my dear, have the unique pleasure of being that connection. I don't... I don't understand any of this. Oh, you will, babe, you will. Took your aunt a while, but she got the hang of it. Your grandmother never really caught on. That's probably why... Why what? Why she didn't last long. But that's something we can talk about later. You felt something today, didn't you? Felt something? Yeah. You felt sick to your stomach, I saw you. I've been feeling sick all day. And where did it start? You mean, the dog run? Yeah, that's where we've gotta go. What, right now? Yep, the sooner the better. But it's the middle of the night. So you've just had a nice nap, you should be ready for action. I'm not going out to Washington Square Park in the middle of the night. Well, that's where you're wrong. If there's any reason behind this medium business, it's to take care of problems like your dog park. And we have to take care of them soon. This is all too much. I've got to sleep on this. Sorry, kiddo. We gotta go now. What's the hurry? Let me put it another way. Do you want to end up like your aunt and grandmother? Was that because of you? Did you do that? Not me, kid, not me. I didn't make him that way, and I don't know what did. But do you really want to sit around here and find out? Fine. Let's go. That's the spirit. After you. That was strange. Everybody just ignored you. Am I the only one who can see you? Yep, and hear me. So keep your voice low. Oh yeah, this is the spot. Can you see it? I don't see anything, can we go? Come on, this way. Hey, wait! Don't worry, I can't travel far from you. It goes against the rules, whatever they are. Now look inside there, and look close. What am I supposed to see? Just wait, it'll come. Wait, I see something. Who is that? That's what we're here to find out. I'll talk to the spook. You can stay here. Okay. If you're interested in the uh, conception of ideas, the idea to use the dog park as a haunted place was when, again, I was looking after my friend's dog, and it was late at night, and the dog needed a walk. So I put the leash on the dog, walked out to Washington Square Park, and went to the dog park. Uh, went in there, opened the gate, let him in. And I looked around, and it was very creepy there at night. Uh, it's just, just looking around, it was empty, it was dark, and it was just, I don't know, it was creepy. 
and it just seemed like a good place to set a ghost story. So that's where that came from. Now watch and learn. Why so down, beautiful? Ah. I'm a bit out of practice. How should I handle this? Hey, don't be like that. If there's one thing I hate, it's seeing a pretty girl cry. Leaving so soon? I thought we were getting along. They all run. It's so hard to hold on. It's me. It's me they won't stop. Who won't stop, kid? Try and concentrate. Explain everything so we can help you. Help. Help. He wants me to help him. But I want to help them. Don't they know that? Help who? Can't. Can't. We run away. We won't run away. No. No, we're sick! He poisoned us! Got into our head and poisoned us. Whatever happened, darling, it's over. You do know that, don't you? No. I'm poisoned. Stay away or I'll poison you! Run! Get away like all the others! So here is Chen's second role, that of Ali, the, the sad, lonely ghost. And she did a really good job here. She really, this is the sort of thing that she normally does anyway. When I got the, uh, when I got her audition reel, it was all like sad, lonely, confused girl. And I'm like, ah, oh, perfect for Ali. Um, but I also saw how tough she could be. So I figured she could do Kelly as well. But here, um, the voice echoes. And at first I debated whether or not I should make the voice echo because uh, Joey's voice doesn't echo. Um, but I didn't want to make Joey echo because uh, it would get, Away, get in the way of the acting too much and Abe has a, a wide range and Joey has such a wide range of emotions that I didn't want to uh, have the echo mask that and Allie it didn't matter as much because she's really just playing one emotion uh, for the whole time so it wouldn't really affect that too much and plus the echo makes her scary and, and all mysterious and stuff and I, I kind of like that and um, I put it uh, before the beta testers and asked them what they thought, and they said, yeah, definitely make Allie's voice echo. So uh, I made her voice echo, and I think it works well. You're beautiful when you're angry. Has anyone told you? No. You won't trap me again. Again? He made everyone go away. There is nobody else. You're him. Who? Him. Now look, darling, sweetheart, Leave me. Hey. Leave. All right. We're going. Look, just sit tight. We'll figure this out, and we'll be back. Friggin' ghosts. Can't get a straightforward answer out of any of them. What just happened? What just happened is we've got an unstable spirit on our hands, haunting that dog park over there. You wondered why the mutts don't like it here? That's the reason. There's a ghost haunting the dog park. That's what I said. A ghost. Sure. What am I doing here? I told you. No. No. I really should go to bed. Hey, wait a sec. Yeah, sleep. I shouldn't be here. Oh, for the love of Pete. Chris Fimo, the guy who did this background and the Washington Square Park backgrounds, uh, did a game a few years ago called Enclosure, which uh, was done in a, with an engine called AGI, um, which, which creates these really old school, I mean even more old school than this game, old school Sierra style, I'm talking low resolution, blocky graphics, and uh, he made a really great game using that engine just to say he could and it's a, it came as a surprise when uh, I first got in touch with him to learn that he could really seriously draw the hell out of a background uh, he kind of went the AGI route as a personal challenge just to see if he could take those old school blocky graphics and make them sing and he really did Enclosure is, in, is an incredible game and when he had a, a much wider palette to use you can just look at this background here I mean he just did some amazing stuff with it. So he, um, 
It's actually quite, uh, actually quite, that's the coolest thing ever, that he, he made that AGI game just because he could. Just because he wanted to prove that he could, he could do something with it. And I find that very, very admirable. So good, good going, Chris. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm lucky to have him on board. Uh. What an odd dream. Good morning, Bright Eyes. Uh. You're still here. Wouldn't be anywhere else. Has anybody told you that you snore? I do not snore. Like a chainsaw, darling. I'd be a little hacked off if I actually slept. So this is going to be my life from now on. Pretty much, yeah. You're going to follow me around for the rest of my life. That's how it works, as far as I can tell. Great. Just great. Hey, it ain't all a bed of roses for me either, dollface. You think I chose to be shackled to your family for the last 40 years? Your grandmother refused to accept it, and look what happened to her. And auntie? She made a mistake. What kind of mistake? Hey, what is this, 20 questions? What's with the third degree? She's the only family I had. I want to know about her. We all want lots of things. Doesn't mean we get them. Look, this isn't easy, you know. You're a ghost? Fine. I'm a medium? Fine. My whole life is turned upside down? Fine. But you could at least meet me halfway. You've accepted it, you say? So far, yes. You've only seen a taste of it. Are you ready to go all the way? What do you mean? Ready to see what's out there. Ready to see what this is all about. Yes. Good. Maybe there's hope after all. So what is it? I don't have to tell you. It's best if I show you. Here, take a hold of this. I can touch it? Yeah, the only part of me you can touch, unfortunately. It kind of tingles. Alright, I have to apologize. I showed this game, I showed this scene to some friends at a, uh, what was, at, at a party recently. And, um, apparently I don't have a, as dirty a mind as I thought, but apparently these lines that you just heard could be taken in rather a, um, a dirty fashion. Um, the tie could be a metaphor for something else, and it could be read that way. And I... Totally did not think that when I was writing this. Uh, I guess I am a lot more innocent than I than I thought. But if anyone out there was offended, if you have any any little ones that are that are crying and are upset and are scarred for life, I do apologize. What is it? The stuff of life, or death. I've never quite worked it out. What now? Now you pull. Pull the tie. Yeah, pull. Okay. <laughs> I love that falling animation. I could watch it all day. Um, Ian managed to do a falling animation, and what's special about this falling animation, I, I don't know if you can tell, but it's all within the same frame. Like when Rosa walks, it's in uh, a frame, and he managed to make Rosa fall within that same frame. It's uh, the exact same width and length as the walking frame. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, if you know what I'm talking about, you could, you'll understand it's quite a quite an achievement to to have Rosa fall in such a narrow narrow frame space. Uh, and Ian um, is an amazing amazing animator. This guy uh, took the indie gaming world by storm with his Apprentice series a few years ago. He just came out with a game called. Super Jazz Man. Um, I haven't actually played it because it literally just came out today, but I have been busy working on this game, as you probably know. Uh, but I hear it's awesome, so check it out. Uh, he just did, he turned into Superman towards the end. He just delivered sprites and animations so fast, it was like, uh, held the guy up at gunpoint. It, he, was, he did amazing stuff. So uh, good job, Ian, all around. Oh my god, where have you taken me? Relax. Take your time. It's a lot to take in at once. What is this place? It's the doorway to infinity, darling. Out there, in the distance, the next world. The next plane of existence. The gossamer threads that separate this world from the next. Whatever you want to call it. It's all out there. How did we get here? We're inside your head. You mean I'm dreaming? No, I mean we're literally inside your head. Remember those headaches you had yesterday? Yeah. That was your power awakening. Or to be more specific, it was this place. 
forcing its way into your mind. This is another big old info dump about uh, Joey and Rosa in the world and having the things they do, the whole the whole tie thing, the whole uh, void thing. Um, that's all uh, a big, big, big info dump. And uh, I mentioned before how that's a bad idea. Uh, and I did it again. <laughs> I did it twice in the same game. Uh, yeah, again, another, what was I thinking, an apology moment. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. So what does that mean? It means that you've got a spiritual way station in your head. I'm not sure I like this. Well, like it or not, we're here. So what does this place actually do? It's sort of a transfer point, or node. It connects the mortal world with the next. You bring spirits into this place, and then send them on their merry way. That's it. Well, there's a bit more to it than that. I thought as much. You see, many ghosts aren't as lucid as myself. Most can barely tell you their own names, let alone tell you what's wrong. Near as I can figure, they have to come to terms with their... departure. Before they can actually depart. You dig me so far? I think so. The ghosts don't know they're dead. Yeah, yeah, right. So, we have to help them accept it. Once they accept their death, they are much more willing to move on. That's my job, see? I talk to the spooks. They trust me more because I'm one of them. You do the legwork. See? Anyway, I know you have some questions about this place, so go ahead and ask them. Believe it or not, I came up with this concept on a bus driving uh, to Cardiff, Wales. <laughs> I was just visiting some friends uh, to an event called Britain's, an adventure game studio meetup. Uh, I was on a bus trying to hash out the plot ideas for the series, and um, I came up with this place, mainly because I knew that Rosa was going to free all these ghosts. And it was getting way too complicated. I, I, I had this idea that each one would be freed in a kind of metaphorical way, and it just got so complicated. And I just decided to keep it very simple. I wanted it, the logic to remain the same for each ghost. They are freed by pulling them into this, you know, uh, this place, which I called Node Space. I don't know how I came up with that name. Uh, it's a stupid name, but I call it Node Space. I don't call it that in the game. But um, I came up with Node Space is just the way to get the ghosts out and on, out and on their way. And it's simple, and the concept works, and you could do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, I'm definitely going to be expanding the, the whole mystique of this place later on. So uh, right now, um, it's very basic, it's functional, it does the job. Uh, later on, there's some funky things that are going to happen here, so uh, stay tuned. What about that ghost in the park? The one from last night? Why didn't we bring her here? First of all, I didn't think you were ready. And secondly, that ghost was too lost and confused. When a ghost is like that, I can't just force the tie into their hands. It won't work, don't ask me why. They have to know they're dead first. Your aunt called it, uh, being spiritually ready. What about you? Can you go through that hole and move on? I wish, darling. But I can't. I've tried before, but it just spits me back out. I'm stuck here, whether I like it or not. You're wearing your tie again. How did that happen? Not sure. Near as your aunt and me figured, the tie is just an extension of whatever power brought us here. It's not a real physical tie. No more than I am a real physical person. But that makes no sense. Look, just accept it, dollface. Forget logic. For you, logic went out the window the day I appeared in your bedroom. There ain't no instruction manual for this. Your aunt and me just figured it out as we went along. Are you okay, Joey? Me? I'm dandy. You don't look alright. Uh, it's just this place. I don't like it. Probably because I don't belong. Maybe someday, but not now. I think I've learned enough. You sure? Yeah. All right. Let's get out of here.
welcome back. Ugh. Take it easy. It's a little disorientating. I'm fine. So what now? Go back to the park and bring her to... that place? You got it. And how do we do that? There are three steps. First, we have to find out more about her. Second, we use that information to get through to her, convince her that she's dead. And three, help her move on. How do we find out more about her? She could be anybody. Not necessarily. That picture you got, the one of the three girls? That blonde girl is either the ghost in the park or her twin sister. You sure? She's a dead ringer. No pun intended. The blonde girl is dead. Looks like it. And this other girl, Joanne, she's dead too. Yep. What's going on? That, my dear, is our bread and butter. What else can we do to learn more about the ghost in the park? The photo, dear, it's the biggest clue we have. What else can we do to learn more about the ghost? The photo, dear. How do we convince ghosts that they're actually dead? That's the tricky part. Near as I can figure, we need to remind the ghosts who they are. Their death was too traumatic, or too violent, or too emotional that their little spirit minds snapped. So we need to do whatever we can to bring them back to themselves. And how do we do that? Usually by finding something that has a personal significance to them. It could be an object, a piece of information, or even another person. So we need to know more about the ghost in the park. You're a writer, yeah? Think of this as the ultimate character study. How do we help a ghost move on? With my magic tie, dear. I give one end to the spook, the other end to you. You pull the ghost- You don't come in with me? No, sorry. That's your job. How do we help a ghost move on? With my magic tie, dear. I give one end to the spook, the other end to you. You pull the ghost in, and you send them on their way. You don't come in with me? No, sorry. That's your job. I think I've heard enough. Yeah, let's get going. I don't want to ruin... Kelly gave me the photograph in the first place. I probably should return it to her. I'm not ready for bed. I want to talk to you, Joey. Yeah? I think I've heard enough. Yeah, let's get- Hey, Joey. What do you want, sweetheart? What else can we do to learn more about the ghost in the park? The photo, dear. It's the biggest clue we have. Remind me, how do we convince ghosts that they're dead? Like I said, we need to find something that has personal significance to them. Like an object, a piece of information, or even another person. How do we help a ghost move on? With my magic tie, dear. I give one end to the spook, the other end to you. You pull the ghost in, and you send them on their way. You don't come in with me? No, sorry. That's your job. What was Auntie Lauren like? What do you want to know about her for? I just do. Can't you tell me anything? Hey, we've got lots to do. Ask me later. What was my grandmother like? Her? We have to talk about her? What's wrong with her? Nothing. Forget it. Ask me later. How did you die? Excuse me? How did I die? Yeah. That's a bit of a personal question, isn't it? Is it? Yes! Sorry. So what can you actually do? Do? As a ghost. Any powers or anything like that? What you see is what you get, dear. I can float through walls as long as I'm still near you. But you can't touch anything. Not really. Not really? Well, you remember that breeze you felt when I manifested myself last night? Yeah. That's the extent of my physical presence. Neat trick, huh? Not really. Everyone's a critic. 
Can't you stay still? Huh? The way you float all over the room like that, you're making me dizzy. <laughs> you sound like my mother. You're just gonna have to get used to it, babe. Can you ever leave? Leave? What do you mean, leave? Leave. Get out of my apartment. Go somewhere else. What, don't you like me? Well, it's not that. It's just, well, what about privacy? I'll turn my back when you're in the shower, don't worry. And what about personal space? I'm a ghost. It's not like I take up any space. You know what I mean. Sorry, darling, no can do. I told you I can't travel far from my... hosts. I can go maybe 30 feet before something stops me. That must be annoying. That's eh, not so bad now. After 25 years watching your aunt drool, this is like staying at the Ritz. You're sure that the ghost you saw is the girl in this picture? Positive. That's a very strong coincidence. <laughs> when it comes to your family, kid, there are no coincidences. It's like... Trouble goes out of its way to find you. How reassuring. Just calling him as I see him. I think I've heard enough. Yeah, let's get going. You coming? Yeah, sure. Hey, it's open! After you. How many references to my earlier games can you find in this room? Uh, this isn't something I asked Chris to do. It's not something I asked him to do. He kind of did it on his own. Uh, you'll see the Shiva poster um, kind of in the foreground there. It's a very low-res version of the, of the Shiva poster. One of my early, early, early designs of Rosa is sitting there on top of the, uh, on top of the closet. Uh, the Kiss poster, which was seen in uh, Two of a Kind, is on this wall. Um, Although, I guess that's not really a, a two-of-a-kind thing. Anyone can be a KISS fan. Uh, so yeah, um, references. Yay, gotta love them. Yeah? Can I use your phone? You what? It'll only take a second. Fine, fine, just hurry up. Who do you think you're calling? If anyone ever gets stuck in Blackwell Legacy, it's here. And there's a reason for that. Uh, in order to solve this puzzle, uh, it's required that you have spoken to Joey on a very specific topic earlier in the game. Uh, you have to go back to Rose's apartment and talk to Joey about his special abilities. And a lot of people didn't do that. And so they get stuck here and they look online for a walkthrough. And the walkthrough says to tell Joey to use his power on Kelly's papers. And they're like, well, how do I do that? I don't know how to do that. The option doesn't come up to do that. It's because they didn't talk to Joey about that specific thing. So, uh, the walk. So, I guess the lesson here is that you can't always trust the walkthrough. You sometimes have to use your brain to figure things out. Not now. I'm on the phone, sorta. Thanks again, Kelly. Yeah, sure. Could I ask you some follow-up questions, Kelly? Fine. Make it quick. Thanks again for lending me that photograph. No big deal. It was just sitting there on her desk. How are you holding up? I'm fine. Midterms are a bitch, but I'm handling it. Or I would be handling it if you didn't keep bugging me. Can I take a look around? What for? Just to see if I can find anything else about Joanne. What, you're a detective now? Well, forget it. Could you tell me about the other two girls in the photo? Oh, them. You know them? Only through Joanne. Do you know their names? The blonde girl is... Allie, I think. And the Asian girl? She's Susan. Tried to avoid them when they were here. Really? Why? Look, I need my space. Joanne needed her friends around her. So whenever Joanne turned this place into Social Central, I had to split. 
They didn't care for me, and I didn't much care for them. Before you discount Kelly as being a horrible, horrible, nasty bitch, uh, I want to let you know that I based a lot of Kelly's uh, observations and annoyances on my own experience in college. I shared a room with a guy, uh, and Michael, if you're listening to this, you know, um, you're awesome, but this drove me nuts. Uh, I shared him with a guy who was so social and a heck of a lot more social than I was. And I, not that I was antisocial, but I would do all my socializing outside of the dorm room. I wanted to hang out with people. I would leave. When I wanted to relax and be alone, I would come back to the dorm room. This guy uh, would leap, open up the door, turn on the radio, invite the entire world in. It would drive me nuts, and I turned into Mr. Sourpuss Grumpy Face because I'm like, I just want to be alone. And I was, uh, so a lot of Kelly's uh, anger towards her roommate was based on my own experiences. Do you know anything about Joanne's friend Allie? You mean Miss Blondie? Yeah. I know enough, which isn't much. She was over here all the time visiting Joanne. She was kind of sweet, I guess. Laughed all the time. Ugh, that was annoying. That was usually my cue to get out of here. What do you want to know about her? I'm having difficulty finding her. Would you know where she is? I don't know. She could be anywhere. Studying? Partying? Pushing up daisies. Shh. Huh? Nothing. Right? I don't suppose you'd know anything about Susan. Not much. Quiet, I guess. Maybe she just didn't talk around me. I never stuck around long enough to get to know her. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Thanks again, Kelly. Whatever. I'm not taking Kelly's things. I'm not getting into Kelly's bed. She hates me enough already. I'm not lugging that thing around. Can I? No. Joanna and I might not have been buddies, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna let some stranger pop through her stuff. I'm not lugging that thing around. The future Mrs. Davenport? I wonder what that means. The future Mrs. Davenport? I wonder what that means. I recognize her. That's Joanne. That's her, the ghost in the park. She looks so happy here. I wonder what happened to make her like that. There's a notebook on Joanne's desk. It's just a telephone. Can I use your phone again? Again? It'll only take a second. Fine, yeah, whatever. Just hurry up. Thanks again, Kelly. Yeah. The safety bars on the window prevent me from opening it. Can I use your phone again? Again? It'll only take a second. Fine, yeah, whatever. Just hurry up. Hello, could I speak to Joey, please? Hi, Joey? Um... Yes, I had some questions for you. Ah! <laughs> not bad, kid, not bad. If you got something to say, say it quick. Lady Pincushion here is starting to look a little hot under the collar. You performed a little trick for me earlier. I'd like you to repeat it for me. Trick? Joey, do you see the pile of papers on the desk? Yeah? I need you to work your magic on them. Uh, sure, sure, I can handle that. It's 
it's funny knowing about the future black hole games my first instinct on how to solve this puzzle would be to just switch to joey and blow on the papers uh but in blackwell legacy um you couldn't control joey and uh, that obviously changed in future installments. I enabled uh, the player to control Joey. You could switch between both of them at will. And I thought about, well, while doing this revamp, well, hey, maybe I'll add the ability to switch to Joey. But I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I didn't, uh, I don't want to play George Lucas. Uh, some small superficial changes, fine, but nothing, nothing groundbreaking. So uh, I kept it as it was. Thanks again, Kelly. Yeah, sure. Can I? No. Joanne and I might not have been buddies, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let some stranger pop through her stuff. There's a notebook on... Can I use your phone again? Again? It'll only take... Fine. Hello? Hi. Joey, could you do that little... Tr I'm not sure where you're going. Thanks again, Kelly. Yeah, sure. There's a notebook on Joe. There's a notebook. Nice one. Looks like standard poli sci lecture notes. It looks like Joanne liked to doodle in class. The last set of notes in this notebook are pretty strange. I'd better take a closer look. I actually saw a doodle almost exactly like this um, somewhere. You know, I, I don't remember where it was exactly. I just remember seeing this doodle, and it was almost this exact same thing. Um, you know, the three stick figures of three girls, uh, two at the top had a guy next to them, and one of the guys was crossed out. And then at the bottom, the, the girl said, so many men, so little time. And I just looked at these three pictures, three stick figures and it's like I got the three personalities or I just learned enough about these three girls like to kind of develop little um, I don't know uh, personality profiles and I always thought it was a nice way to give information about characters without having to do a lot of work basically uh, this this little picture tells a lot about Joanne Susan and Allie and in a way these three girls are very much cliches uh, they are a little one-dimensional Joanne is the smart one, Susan is the quiet one, and Allie is the pretty funny one. However, uh, since Susan is drugged out in a mental asylum, Joanne is dead, and Allie is a ghost in a park, I figure their, their one-dimensionality uh, won't bother people too much, so uh, I think I can forgive myself for not giving them too much of a personality. Like standard. It looks like Joanne liked to the last set of notes in this. I'd better take. Hmm. I think it's safe to say that these refer to the same person. Ask you some follow up questions, Kelly. <sighs> Fine. Make it quick. Do you know an Alexander Davenport? No. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Thanks again, Kelly. Whatever. So, congratulations, kid. You committed your first burglary. 
Is that what I just did? For the greater good, kid. For the greater good. That makes me feel so much better. I'm not stealing Just a bunch of notices. Guitar lessons, study groups, stuff like that. There's nobody. Hmm? Hi, it's me again. You have more questions, I imagine? Yeah, is that okay? I suppose so. What do you want to know? Do you know an Alexander Davenport? The name doesn't ring a bell, I'm afraid. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for helping out. Just remember, leave my name out of it. Hmm. The school thought that Adrian was a girl because of his name. Alex could also be a girl's name. I wonder. Hmm? Hi, it's me again. You have more questions, I imagine? Yeah, is that okay? I suppose so. What do you want to know? Do you know an Alexander Dad? The name doesn't ring. Well, that's all. Thanks for helping out. Just remember, leave my name out of it. I don't want to, but I guess we should talk to the ghost again. Don't worry. I'll do the talking. I remember even five years ago when uh, creating this scene and, and seeing these two ghosts in the scene that they just didn't look very good. Uh, they just don't look very good in daylight. In a daylight scene, ghosts just don't look good. Uh, I tried playing with transparencies. I tried doing all sorts of stuff. It just they just didn't look good. And so there's a reason why all the future Blackwell games take place at night. Uh, Convergence has some scenes during the day, but uh, the sky is deliberately kept very cloudy and dark and moody. So you don't it, it, they so they, the ghosts look cool. Uh, in exterior shots. So I guess you will not be seeing many bright sunny days in future Blackwell games. Hey there. Remember me? No. Maybe. For a lot of this commentary, I keep talking about things that I've done wrong and things that I would have done differently and things I regret doing five years ago or things that I just have mistakes that I learned from. But uh, I, something about this character, Allie, I did something very right because a lot of customers have told me that um, I took some scenes from this uh, section and I put it in the trailer, the original trailer for Blackwell Legacy. And a lot of customers have told me that it was uh, Allie's moments in the trailer that convinced them to buy the game. <laughs> so there's something about Allie here that uh, resonated with people. Uh, and even though with, through my complete lack of experience, uh, I did something really right here. So for that, I'm very glad. Can you tell me the last thing you remember? Candy. I was eating candy. Candy? Candy to make the deacon go away. Ah, I think I understand. Did it work? I don't hear him anymore, but he did something to me. He'll go away. Are you friends with a girl named Joanne? 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 Beware of Joanne when her plans are for all, where she intends to go over the world. She had to go away. He drove her away. Do you know why Joanne killed herself? Joanne? She can't be dead. She's going to change the world. She's not dead. Even though she had to go away. They all had to go away because of the deacon. Do you know Kelly? Kelly, Kelly, crazy Kelly, made of ice jelly. 
we all drove her away. But that was okay. It wasn't with Deacon's fault. It was hers. Is your name Allie? Yes, that's me. Allie Lentego, a story and song. She kisses the boys, but not for long. Cute. Well, Allie Montego. At least we've confirmed who you are. Can you tell me about your friend Susan? Quiet Sue. Little Lady Lee. Always meet and always there. Won't say much, but you'll know she's there. Lady Lee? She had to go away. Stupid deacon. Sending away all my friends. Even the little, little ones. Do you know anyone named Alexander Davenport? On a date with Alexander the Great. Was it an accident or was it just fate? Can you tell me who the deacon is? The deacon is the deacon. We called him and he came. He got into my head. He's scared. He's diseased. He's made me diseased too. Now everyone goes away. Look, just sit tight. We'll figure this out, and we'll be back. That place is creepy. What? You don't like dogs? You know what I mean. No, I can't find any information about Joanne. My article hasn't been published yet. Typical. No, no information about Kelly. Hmm, and Alexander Davenport was listed as being on the hockey team at NYU. It doesn't say anything else about him, though. That's too common a word. Whoever the deacon is, I don't think I'll find him this way. Ali Montego. Let's see if I can find her. Hmm. She apparently spent some time on a spiritual internet forum. She was looking for information about Ouija boards? Are Ouija boards dangerous? She asked. Can they call anything evil? And if so, how do you get rid of it? Oh, jeez. Another bunch of hacks messing with those stupid boards. This has happened before? A few times. Those things are nothing but trouble. Lee is a pretty common name, but it should narrow things down. I think I got her. Susan Lee, 18 years old, was admitted to Bellevue Hospital last week after an apparent suicide attempt. Here's something interesting. That uh, line you just heard Rosa say was the very last line of Rosa's that I imported into the game. So I figure it would uh, this would be a good opportunity to talk about the whole voice uh, recording thing. Um, holy crap, is it a pain in the neck. Um, voice recording uh, is a whole, like, a whole lot different than doing non-voiced. Because uh, number one, you have to make sure you record everything, and if you don't, you either have to, to fudge it using dialogue you already have, or drag the actors back, and neither of them is a desirable situation. Or uh, you could do what I did with Shiva, which was to um, just have a text narration. And I miss the text narration um, from Shiva because it made it so much easier to, to fudge it. If I forgot to record some dialogue, I could just you know, uh, put a little text narration up. Uh, I don't know if you remember the bartender in Shiva, but the bartender in Shiva doesn't say anything. That's because I, I never recorded the dialogue that the bartender was supposed to say. So in the 11th hour, I just <laughs> made it all text. And it worked. It worked. But in this game, I kind of made a point of not using text. And it's sort of a personal challenge to myself. And there were f a few little moments. And if you've played this game before or listened to this commentary, I'll, I'll be mentioning where they are. Uh, there was the, um, the, 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 the photograph of the Christmas uh, 
the Christmas family picture. Um, there, I forgot to record dialogue. There was a bit later, um, a couple of little places where it's just, you know, I, I had to fudge things. I had to reuse other bits of dialogue previously recorded, and it was very uh, restrictive, actually. I, it was really hard for me to, to do with that because it, it did restrict freedom in terms of what I could change later on. Like, once it's recorded, it's set in stone. And that's something to really keep in mind if any of you out there want to um, pursue this, uh, do this crazy thing that I'm doing. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult, especially in a game like this where... I mean, holy crap, there's a lot of dialogue. I just went a little crazy. So um, I'm, I'm impressed that I managed to get um, all the dialogue down that I did. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I just, that's a little bit of uh, behind the scenes troubles for you guys. I think that's our girl. There are so many sites about this and they all contradict each other. There's no way to really tell fact from fiction. I want to talk to you, Joey. Yes, darling? Do you know anything about Ouija boards? Those things are nothing but trouble. Any idea who the deacon might be? No idea. Although, he must be a pretty formidable fellow considering what's been going on. So the ghost's name is Allie. Looks like it. And she's trapped in the dog run at Washington Square Park. That's where she is. And we have to save her. Yep. Is this going to be a typical day from now on? You'll look back on this as one of the normal ones. I don't suppose you know anything about Susan? Nope, no more than you. Who do you think Alexander is? Well, judging from that silly doodle you're carrying around, I'd say he was Susan's boyfriend. You think he's involved? Anything's possible. I think I've heard enough. Yeah, let's get going. You coming? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Man, I hate this place. I was stuck here for 25 years. Why'd you have to drag me back here, huh? Is Susan Lee a patient here? Susan? Yeah, we've got her. She came in about a week ago. May I visit Susan Lee? Sure. If you're on the approved guest list. Uh, what was your name again? Rosangela Blackwell. Sorry, you're not on the list. She'll be out in a week. You can visit her then. Thanks. Uh-huh. I'd like to see Susan Lee, please. I told you, you're not on the guest list. Oh, well, that's because... I wasn't on the list at the time. I should be on it now. Oh, really? Well, let's check then. What was your name again? My name is Alex Davenport. Huh. Your name is on the list. Can I go in now? Sure. I'll notify the nurse that you're coming. She'll take you in. Thanks. Alexander? Um, no. I'm sorry. Where's Alexander? He's not here. They told me... they told me he was coming. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I... It's okay. 
He doesn't want to see me anyway. Who are you? My name is Rosangela. I'd like to talk to you if that's okay. Are you a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor, but I'd still like to talk to you if that's okay. Mm-hmm. So, Susan, could you tell me what brought you here? I don't know. They think I'm crazy. Are you? Crazy, I mean. I don't know. They think so. I'd like to talk to you about your friend Joanne. You know Joanne? Sort of. What, what about her? Can you tell me about her? She's Joanne. That's all. Do you know why Joanne killed herself? Susan? She just did. Don't know why. Do you know Joanne's roommate, Kelly? Yeah, sorta. Why? Oh, no reason. Can you tell me anything about Alex? He... I don't know. He's nobody. Just some guy. Who is the deacon? What do you mean? The deacon, Susan. He's nobody. Nobody. Do you know what happened to Allie? Yeah. Do you know why she did it? No. Susan, can you tell me why you're here? What happened? Nothing. Just... nothing. Do you know anything about Ouija boards, Susan? Susan? They... Susan? Nothing. I have to go now, Susan, but I'll come back to check on you again. Mm-hmm. The girls were interested in Ouija boards, and they are all haunted by someone named the Deacon. Could there be a connection? I'd like to see Susan Lee, please. Sure thing, you're cleared. Go right in. Hi, Susan. So how are you feeling? Fine. That's all? Yeah, I'm fine. Whatever. Susan, can you listen to me? You're not crazy. I know what happened. You summoned the deacon with a Ouija board. No, that didn't really happen. Susan, you don't have to pretend. I believe you. You do? Whatever happened, I believe you. He still comes to me. The drugs keep him away during the day, but when I sleep, he enters my head and he won't stop screaming. I thought I was crazy, but Joanne and Allie, how could it happen to all three of us? It's impossible. No, it's not. No, it's not. But the Deacon is real? I believe so, yes. Are you here to help me? I'm going to try. Thank God. I was ready to die here, but... I know. Can I ask you some questions about what happened? Sure. Ask whatever you want. The lady playing Susan here, her name is Jennifer Astaris. I actually met her through Sandy Chen, the girl playing Rosa. It's sort of very, very incestuous, all these, these voice actors. But uh, Sandy was hosting some game industry party uh, downtown on the Lower East Side. And I met Jennifer there. And just in talking to her, I could sort of tell that she had done voice acting or acting or something with her voice because she just spoke really well. And it was very, um, I don't know how to quite explain it, but it was very stylized, I guess, the way she spoke. And I said, hey, do you do voice acting? And she said, yes, I do. And she was an opera singer as well. So I asked her, I said, hey, would you want to do a voice for my game? And so she said, yeah. So I, I got her card, I brought her over. And her reaction to the character description when I sent it to her, she said it was yummy. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. 
but apparently that means she liked it because she was willing to do the role. So that's Jennifer. Can you tell me about Allie? Allie. Oh, I miss her so much. The sweetest, funniest person in the world. You couldn't help but smile with her around. She was always dragging us out on some adventure. She was so... different. Every other girl had pictures of boys on their walls. She had pictures of dogs. She loved dogs. She was studying to be a vet to take care of them. And now she can't. She... she was the first of us to go. Why is that? How come the strongest of us was the first to break down? Can you tell me anything about Joanne? Joanne wanted to save the world, but she couldn't even save her friends. After Allie went, Joanne couldn't take it. She blames herself, but it's not her fault. I don't blame her for it. Any of it. It was only luck that I ended up here and didn't die. Do you know why Joanne killed herself? Yes. The deacon. He got in our heads. His voice keeps pleading, babbling. Nothing shuts him up. Just keeps going. I just wanted quiet. Peace and quiet. That's why Joanne jumped off the roof. She was willing to give anything to just keep him quiet. Even her life. So what happened to you, Susan? What did the deacon do to you? The same thing he did to the others. Got into my head and just wouldn't keep quiet. It was just so noisy inside my head. I had to do something. I saw the speeding taxi and I just... Well, you know, here I am. Were you hurt? No. The driver hit the brakes in time. Taxi missed me completely. Then the stupid cop on the corner dragged me here. I can't even kill myself right. Was Kelly involved in any of this? Kelly? Joanne's roommate? Yeah. No. She always left when we came over. She didn't like us much. But that's okay. We didn't like her either. Can you tell me anything about Alex? Alex was my boyfriend, I guess. But since I came here, he won't see me anymore. Just as well. The jerk. I have to go now, Susan. But I'll come back to check on you again. Mm-hmm. Look, Joey, it's starting to get dark. Yeah, I can see that. Was it the darkness that gave it away? I'm just saying. Whoa! Hold on there. You want to go in, I gotta clear you first. I'd like to see Susan Lee, please. Sure thing, you're clear. Go right in. Hi, Susan. Hi. It's good to see you again. How are you now, Susan? Better. It's nice to know I'm not crazy. Yeah, that's a good feeling. It's just... these drugs. The meds help keep the deacon's voice low. And that's good. But they also cause water retention, and I have to take a diuretic pill to fix that. And I'm just sick of peeing all the time. Now that I know I'm just haunted and not really crazy, I don't see why I have to take it. I don't care if I retain water and get fat. I just want to stop peeing. <laughs> Is she for real? I've been palming the pills. Is that bad? I can't answer that. Well, I was hoping you could do me a favor. What? Can you take the pills out of here? I'm scared the orderly will find them. 
please. Fine, uh, give him to me. You are such a chump. Thanks so much. I racked my brains to try to come up with, uh, some sort of puzzle to get the pills away from Susan. And I couldn't think of one, at least not one to keep it logical. And eventually I just bit the bullet and had Susan just give him to you. Uh, so that was that. That was my little cop-out. So do you like Bellevue? It's okay. I used to come here every week. To visit my aunt, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't think she cares. Well, anyway, I'm just saying, I've spent a lot of time here. You don't have to be scared of me. I have to go now, Susan, but I'll come back to check on you again. Mm-hmm. Come in! Look, you've got him all excited. Come in! Are you all right, Rosa? You look a little preoccupied. I'm fine. That's odd. Moti never acts like that. Oh, jeez. In case you haven't noticed, some animals can sense me. Are you getting a good look, Mutt? Boo! What's gotten into you, Moti? I'm sorry, he must be sick or something. It's all right. Hey, boy! There's nothing to be afraid of, I hope. See ya. Okay, I put the pills in the dog biscuit. Hmm, these dog biscuits are really mushy. Hey, boy! Um, what do I do now? Just say, go get it. He'll do the rest. Go get it. Oh, Moti, now? I just took you out an hour ago. Well, you're going to have to wait. I have my hands totally full. Unless... Rosa, would you mind taking Moti for a walk? If you're going to be friends, this is a good opportunity for you to bond. Oh, sure. I don't mind at all. Thank you so much. Moti gets cranky when he doesn't get his way. Just take him to the park until he goes. It shouldn't take long. Right. Here you go, boy. This puzzle here... <laughs> I, uh, again, I get another what was I thinking moment. Uh, you're poisoning a dog, basically, to get through here, uh, and uh, this is this is silly. This is adventure gamey and kind of a little ridiculous. Uh, this isn't something a normal, rational thinking person would do. One of my favorite game journalists, his name is Richard Cobbett. He wrote this wonderful article um, about adventure games and how uh, adventure game characters, uh, player characters, are complete sociopaths doing things that unrational person would never do and this is a case of rosa being a sociopath like she's poisoning of someone's pet to solve a puzzle and i really regret <laughs> doing this because this is so not something she would really actually do um uh, sorry you're drugging innocent dogs now it's only a mild diuretic it won't hurt him and you're the one in such a damn hurry all right point taken 
It's funny how five years later, no one has ever called me out on this really silly thing that I did. You might remember earlier in the game, uh, a big deal was made about uh, the dog and the leash. You had to wrap the leash around the, the pole. It was this big puzzle and, and everything. Uh, so a lot of attention was called onto the dog and the leash. And now, look, you're taking this dog to the dog park and there's no leash. Uh, this dog leash was such a pain in the neck to implement, as you probably heard me rant about it earlier, uh, that I decided that it, I just I just wasn't going to do it <laughs> at this point, uh, and I just prayed that people would would ignore it or forgive it or whatever. But uh, no one seemed to notice it, or if they did, they they weren't bothered enough by it to call me out on it. Uh, so this is my five year post launch confession. So uh, forgive me, please. Hey there, Bright Eyes. It's me again. Are... are you him? No, I'm not, but I've brought some friends. Say hi to the kids, sweetheart. Um, hi. I don't think she wants to see me. Sure she does. Go on, kid. Tell Ellie how much you want to see her. Oh, yeah, sure. Great to meet you. See? I don't believe you. It doesn't matter if you believe me or not. She needs your help. Help? See the dog over there? The Boston Terrier? Good, good, you know your breeds. This Boston Terrier is not feeling too well. I was hoping that you could take a look at him. Uh, yes, yes I can. I know a lot about dogs. So we heard, that's why we came to you. But they won't let me help them. They always run away. This one won't, go on. The dog needs you. So this is your dog, huh? Um, yeah, sort of. Hi, little guy. What's your name? <laughs> right. Are you the cutest little thing? Hmm, your ears look okay. No signs of inflammation. Now I'm just going to open your mouth. That's odd. I don't feel any breath. I don't feel anything. Oh. I'm sorry. I remember. I'm dead. Yep. I killed myself. I had no choice. Can you tell us what happened? My friends and I, we played a game. A Ouija board. We thought it would be fun. And you called something? Yes. He called himself the Deacon. It's... kinda hazy now. But I remember his voice in my head. Screaming. What did he say? I don't know. It didn't make any sense. He just kept asking me to help him. But he wouldn't say how. I tried ignoring him. But he just got louder and louder until I took the pills and- Shh. It's over now. I know. So what now? Now? Now, we're going to send you where you need to go. Here, take this, and hold on tight. You ready? I guess so. Good. Now pull. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Ow. Hello? Yeah, hi! I'm not sure if we've met. I'm Rosangela. I know! You brought the dog to me! You brought me back to my senses. And then you brought me here. Thanks so much! So, are you ready to... well, you know. Am I ready to die? Well, yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of new at this. That's okay. I'm gonna make it easy for you. Just tell me what to do. Just head towards that light. The light. Right. Like every cliche in the book. You think I'll see Joanne over there? I'm sure you'll find whatever it is you want to find. Yeah. I suppose you're right. 
And hey, you'll make sure Susan's okay, right? Sure. Well, here goes. See ya. See ya. Ugh. You're awake. That didn't take too long. She just went. She seemed happy about it. Yeah, sometimes you'll get easy ones. The ones who are all too happy to move on. Others, well, you'll see. Anyway, let's get this dog back before your neighbor calls the police. Our work is not over yet. She is so going to kill me. Just a minute. Oh, oh, there you are. I was just about to go to bed. I'm sorry we took so long. Not to worry. Did you have fun, Moti? Did you have fun? <coughs> of course. Well, good night, Rosa. Thanks again for helping me out. Strange lady. Please be advised as visiting hours are now over. Oh well, looks like we have to wait until tomorrow. No can do, toots. Remember what she said? The deacon comes to her at night when she's sleeping. Waiting until tomorrow won't do us any good. What? You think we can just waltz right into Susan's room? Sure. How? Improvise, sweetheart. That's what this gig is all about. If there was anything that would have delayed the release of this game, it would have been importing the voice clips. It took so long. I actually took a week off from debugging simply to import the voice clips, and I still didn't get it done. I'm talking a full week, you know, five you know, to eight hours every day importing voice clips and still not getting it done. That, that's how many voice clips are in this game. Um, there are at least, you know, Rose Angela alone has about 2,000. Joey has about 1,000. All the other incidental characters maybe have 100 or 200 apiece. And I just, I mean, it just took so long, and I would just be sitting there, all, it'd be like 3 in the morning, importing voice clips, hearing Sandy and Abe uh, and Shen and everyone in my frigging sleep. Uh, it, <laughs> it takes a long time. So that is a little bit of warning for you guys. If uh, you ever plan on pursuing this crazy thing that I'm doing, voice importing takes a long time. So be warned. I need to speak to Susan Lee. Can I see her? Visiting hours are over, miss. She's probably sleeping by now. Thanks. Whoa! Hold on there. Fuse box key? I could probably do something with this. Some small keys. I don't think I need any of these other keys. You need a key to open it. Fuse box key? I could probably do something with this. I don't think I need any. Some small key. One of them is labeled FB. I assume that means fuse box. Fuse box key? I could probably do something with this. I don't think I need any of these other keys. Fuse box key? I could probably do something with this.
There's a lot of adventure game cliches that are considered cardinal sins if you put them in your game. Uh, there's mazes, that's one. The uh, paper under a door to get a key puzzle, uh, that's considered a cardinal sin, even though I've, I've done that myself in, in later games. And another one is the forced stealth section. Uh, that is considered a no-no. And a lot of people had trouble getting past this section because the, they couldn't get to that. They didn't click fast enough on that little alcove um, before the guard comes by. And um, I guess this is kind of a forced puzzle. It, 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 the problem with it is that, I mean, how forgiving is an understanding is this guard? If you could do this puzzle like 20 times and the guard would be like, oh... Uh, and he doesn't like kick you out or call the police or arrest you or detain you or anything. That's kind of adventure game logic for you, which is uh, kind of a no-no. Again, kind of uh, some bad design choices on my part. Again, my very first. This was my very first game five years ago, uh, so hopefully uh, I can be forgiven here. Now you've done it. You better find a place to hide quick. Whoa! You startled me. You'd better leave, Miss. I can't be held liable for your safety until the lights are repaired. I'll get the elevator for you. There's a lot of adventure. Oh, yeah. You better find a place. She's asleep. Yeah, like a baby. It won't be long. Before what? Before that. Please. Please. Can't you help me? Please. I don't know what to do. I don't want to burn. Please! The others are gone. You're the only one! Please! You can't hear me here, but you can hear me in your dreams. Please! Wake up and help me! Ahem! <clears throat> Ignore them, Susan. Listen to me. Help me. Please! Hey! Ignore them, Susan. Listen to me. Help me. Please! I'm talking to you, clown shoes. You're... You're talking to me? The Deacon is a real person, believe it or not. The Deacon actually existed. There is a record of the Deacon existing. Um, and I won't tell you where... Um, I guess I can I can have a little contest. Whoever can tell me where the deacon is mentioned, um, where it's a matter of sort of historical record, uh, sort of, sort of, maybe, kind of. But um, when I read about him, I knew it was someone I wanted to write about. Um, yeah, so he really does exist. Uh, I won't tell you where. I will not tell you where. You have to figure that out for yourselves, guys. Sorry. The first one to email me with the correct answer will win. Uh, I guess you'll win bragging rights, because <laughs> presumably if uh, I can't give you a free copy of the game, because if you're listening to this, you presumably would have already bought a copy of the game. So you'll get a special mention on my website if you happen to get the answer. In the original commentary for this game, I kind of was very deliberately enigmatic about uh, where um, I first heard about the Deacon. Uh, he's sort of loosely based on someone who I assume existed. Uh, if you've played future Blackwell games, you will have uh, met the characters of Joseph Mitchell and Joe Gould. And uh, Joseph Mitchell wrote, they're both real people, and Joseph Mitchell wrote an, uh, a biography about uh, Joe Gould. <clears throat> Not a biography about himself while interviewing, about interviewing Joe Gould. And um, one of the stories Joe Gould told Mitchell was about some crazy career drunk who called himself the Deacon, who was convinced that the devil was after him and going to drag him to hell. And uh, something about that character resonated with me, and I um, 
imagine this ghost of that same deacon who was worried about being dragged to hell. And especially if you're a dead person, you're going to worry about that kind of thing. So I turned into this character here. Yeah, so can you calm down long enough to tell me what's going on? I... I can't. You're like me. What do you mean? Dead. Like me. Wait a minute. Just a goddamn minute. You know you're dead? Yes. Well, that certainly saves time. We can help you. Here, grab a hold of this. No. Get that away from me. What the hell is wrong with you? You need saving. We're here to save you. What's the problem? I can't. What are you so scared of? You're stuck, right? We can help you move on. No. I don't, I don't want, want to. You don't want to? No, I... I'm afraid. Oh, you're afraid, are you? You believe this guy? All right, Mac, spill. You've scared these girls literally to death, and I want to know why. What are you so afraid of? I... I don't, don't want to burn. Burn? Oh, oh, I get it. You think you're going to hell. But the devil himself. He told me. Please don't make me go. You're scared of the devil, huh? Yes! Yeah, well, I don't see any devil. There's just you and me. And you know what? I'm worse than any devil you'll ever see. Hey! I've been doing this for 40 years, bucko. Every ghost I meet goes to their final rest one way or the other. You're scared? I don't give a rat's ass. Two people are dead because of you. So take the damn tie and let's get this over with. No! You can't make me. Don't make me burn, please! <sighs> Hurts, don't it? How? Oh. Ghosts aren't supposed to feel pain, but I've learned some tricks. Now take the damn tie! Joey has evolved <laughs> over the years. Uh, he first was seen in a, in a freeware game of mine called Purity of the Surf. Um, it was a reality on the norm game, uh, and I kind of included Joey in there as a way to promote uh, my next freeware game called Bestowers of Eternity. And he originally was kind of the wacky sidekick. He had the, the suit and he had the hat. He just kind of cracked a lot of jokes and all that stuff. And I kind of, um, I was kind of intended for him to be a little serious. He just never came across as being serious. And when I wrote this game, I purposely um, made him uh, not so funny. He's not funny. Uh, even when he does make a joke, and he does say some pretty funny things, it's kind of a as a way to, to mask a little bit of bitterness. Like, a lot of the jokes are, are based on some kind of bitterness, or it's just a way to kind of mask inner feelings, that kind of thing. So that's sort of where the, the jokes come from. Uh, I'm not sure if that comes across or not, but that's sort of my intention. And Abe did it very well. Like, sometimes he would... He would Abe is a very funny guy. If you listen to the bloopers, Abe is a, a funny, funny, funny guy. And so a lot of the times I would have to hold him back. I said, you know, don't be so wacky. Don't be so wacky when you say that line. You know, say it a little little sarcasm, a little, I uh, think, more Edmund Blackadder than Jim Carrey. <laughs> so, or Ron Atkinson than Jim Carrey. And uh, more deadpan, more, more you know, sarcastic and, and biting. Uh, and that's sort of the, the idea there. And here, especially, Joey is not being funny. He's laying a smackdown on the poor deacon there and uh, he finally gets a chance to let loose and this I kind of like this uh, idea here because I wanted to um, show that Joey has a freaking violent side and you can't get more violent than grabbing someone by their shirt and punching them in the stomach multiple times so uh, I think I made that pretty clear Joey stop it kids stay out of this this is between me and the spook. So, are we gonna do this the easy way? Or the hard way? Please! No! What are you gonna do to me? Please don't make it get me! I don't wanna go to hell! Hell schmell. You wanna stop talking crap? Hey, stop! Let me talk to him, okay? Kids, stay out of this. This is between me and the spook. I don't believe in hell, buddy. But you have two choices. The slight possibility of an eternal torture in hell, or the dead certainty of an eternal torture by me. 
But you can't. Sure I can. You gonna stop me? Make your choice. I... Wrong answer. You're hurting him, Joey. Yeah, that's the idea. You got any better ones? Let me talk to him. Kids, stay out of this. This is between me and the spook. Well? Fine. Just, Just stop, stop hurting, hurting me, please. Good boy. Take the tie. Joey, this... This what? It got the job done, didn't it? Now yank this loser out of here so we can go home. Fine. Good riddance. Ow. I don't, don't want to do this. this. Please, send, send me back. I don't think that's possible. He forced, he forced me here. I... It's... At last, I have found you. No! I told you! There's no escape! What is that? Oh, crap! Joey? Joey! Get me out of here! Stay away. Stay away! There is nowhere to go. You cannot return to the mortal world. You can only go through me. Accept the punishments for your sins and come with me. Help me, please! You brought me here! You have to save me! You have to! Fool, no one can save you now. I'll give you a moment to prepare for the eternity to come, but then you are mine. For those of you who can't tell, that voice is actually me. I did the voice of that demon, and it was something I decided to do when I came up with the character. And this was so much fun to play, because I can actually walk you through the process right here. Uh, first, I would I would talk in a growly voice like this, and I'd I'd uh, then I would use audacity and lower the pitch by 16%. And then when I was done with that, I would, I would add, add an, an echo, echo to my to voice. Ha <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'll do it again. I hope I can use this character once more. What is that thing? It's come, come to, to take, take me to hell! Just like it always said it would. What is that thing? I... don't know! It haunted my dreams when I was alive, and wouldn't leave me alone after death. And now, there's no place left to run. What is that in your pocket? My flask. Yeah, what's in it? Nothing. It's just a... Force of habit, I guess. Used to keep whiskey in it when I was alive. What are your sins? What have you done? I don't know. Please, God, I don't know. I didn't mean to kill those people. It's just I've been so scared and I don't know why. Please help. So what can I do? What does he want? He wants me. I don't know why. Please, help! Uh, excuse me. Converse with me not. I shall give him time to prepare himself for the eternity to come, but then he is mine.
How did you get here? What is here? It is but an abstract concept to one such as I. I move at the power of thought, at the speed of death. Once my business is concluded, I shall trouble you no more. Why are you after this man? For his sins. All this time, he has not renounced them. Even after these many years of death, he still carries them with him. Can't you just let him go? He has killed many with his madness. His sins weigh him down even as we speak. Ask yourself, does he deserve mercy? Yes? You may think so, but your heart does not believe it. You have witnessed the results of his actions with your own eyes. The deacon is carrying his sins, and the deacon is carrying his flask. Could this be symbolic? Get rid of that flask. Huh? Your flask! Get rid of it! My flask? Why? Just do it! But, but I can't! Why not? Because it, it's my flask! You want to be free of that demon? Trust me. Oh, oh okay. You no longer carry your sins with you, dead one, but they still taint this place. That is not enough to save you. Please, help! There's nothing really special about it except that it belonged to a ghost. It's kind of vibrating. It is done. The sins have been abolished from this place. And my claim on you, dead one, is gone. Move on in peace and be troubled no more. In the design document for the game, for this scene, I had written, Rosa convinces the deacon that the demon is a metaphorical representation of his inner demons. Uh, yeah, it's easy to write, <laughs> not as easy to um, expand upon. And uh, this was my <laughs> biggest trouble. I wanted to have that demon there, if only because I wanted the ending lacked something. It needed something climactic. And having a big friggin' ass demon there, you know, about to rip someone's soul apart, uh, you can't get more climactic than that. And uh, But I was having trouble figuring out how this was going to play. And I had written every single line of dialogue for the entire game. And, uh, or at least the majority of it, and I was stuck with this. I couldn't figure it out. And uh, finally, I just kind of, out of frustration, I just said, well, you know, forget the deacon. I'm just going to write a, write some dialogue with the demon. And I just uh, started writing and blah, blah, blah. And I wrote the line, uh, he, the, he is still carrying his sins with him. It just kind of came out, and then it was like, ding, the light bulb appearing above my head. The whole puzzle just clicked right into place. Uh, after weeks and weeks of frustration, I, I finally figured it out, and uh, that's could, that's some advice for you guys. If you're having trouble uh, getting your mind around right a certain puzzle, if something doesn't work right, or if something just doesn't, yeah, you know, you can't quite get it to fit, uh, try working on a different aspect. Try switching gears. That definitely helped me get this puzzle down. Uh, well, uh, helped me get it down pat, and I quite I quite like the way it turned out. He's gone? I think so. He's gone. I'm, I'm free of him. I'm really free. All this time, it's all so clear to me now. Like my head was full of cobwebs and now they're gone. I... All those people who died, they killed themselves because of me. It's all right. No, it's not all right. 
I didn't know what I was doing. But that doesn't excuse it. I spent most of my life as a drunk. And most of my death as a murderer. I was worried about going to hell before. Maybe I'm okay with that now. Now that I know I might deserve it. You seem strangely happy about it. I'm just happy to know. You see, I was a religious man once. Before disease took my wife away, and I took to the bottle. If I'm going to hell, well then maybe I can still spread the word of God there. Do some good for once. Well, this is it. Goodbye, and thanks. Jesus Christ, kid, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. What took you so long? It got a little complicated. Well, I'm just glad you're okay. Let's get out of here. I need some air. I know the perfect place. He's at peace now, I guess. Wherever he is. I saved him, I think. Gave him some hope, at least. He's getting no more than he deserves. No more than any of us deserve. I guess. Did you have to hit him? It was the only way, darling. I didn't see you coming up with any bright ideas. Sometimes the best idea is a punch in the gut. Joey? Yeah? Why did Auntie stop? Stop what? Stop doing this. This ghost saving or whatever it is we do. Oh. Ah. Uh. It was you. Me? She wanted to take care of you. Wanted to do it right, she said. Stop listening to me. Stop saving the ghosts. Just put all her effort into taking care of you. And then she fell into that weird coma. Yeah. I see. I guess there's a lesson in that. Is there? Yeah. I gave some thought to editing or changing this ending when I was re-recording the lines, and in the end I decided to keep it. Uh, I felt very strongly about this ending when I first made it five years ago, and even when I was designing the game, I knew the game would end uh, like this. Uh, though I think it might have been a little too clever, or not clever exactly, but maybe too subtle and um, kind of oblique and mysterious for its own good. I think that was my one of my major weaknesses back then, is that I tried to be very clever, like with the deacon and, and all this stuff, like, you know, just stuff that, oh, they'll they'll get it later, uh, which I think is a mistake. Um, but but anyway, I think this I like this ending because it's... Uh, yeah, Joey kind of gives this reveal about the aunts and how uh, Rosa now quietly accepts that uh, accepts this new position in her life. Like this is going to be her life from now on, and that yeah at the end just kind of conveys all of that. Um, uh, since I was re-recording it anyway, I kind of redid that one word several times just to get it just the way I wanted it, and uh, I still like it. I still like the ending. A lot of people don't like it. They felt it ended too abruptly. They uh, thought there, it should have been punchier. There was more that could have been said. Eh, screw that. I'm keeping it like it is.
There's hundreds of confused spirits out there, sweetheart. And there's nobody else who can help him. There's just us. Bestowing eternity on every sob story out there. One lost soul at a time. Whether we want to or not. So obviously it's been five years since I released this game. Uh, and it's interesting just revisiting uh, this game five years later uh, because things are a lot different now. I mean, the company is bigger. We've got a lot more games under our belt. We've been published by uh, a major publisher once, and we are now publishing other people. It's now a real business, and, and it's it's weird because I'm in that weird position sometimes where I'm spending most of my day doing business stuff than game development stuff. And when I think back think back to Blackwell Legacy, uh, my work was the game and nothing else. I didn't think about business stuff. I didn't think about marketing or PR or how I was going to sell the game. I was just making the game and that was it. Life was a lot simpler then. And that sounds weird and cliche and esoteric, but it is true. And it is kind of, it was very nice to revisit that part of my life. And it has been a, an amazing five years since this game came out. Uh, I certainly didn't expect to be doing this, still be doing this five years later. No one's more surprised than me. And I really owe it all to you guys, of course, who, uh, especially those of you who bought this game when it first came out five years ago and have come back game after game after game, uh, obviously saw something really good in it, despite all the flaws that I've mentioned over the course of this commentary. Uh, it's, it's nice to know that despite my inexperience, despite my shoot and blind in terms of design, that I did more right than wrong. And you guys like the games and keep coming back. And that means more to me than, than anything else. And that's really all I can say. I know this is very esoteric and strange, but all I can say is thank you. Uh, I think I said thank you in the original commentary. I am saying it again. Thank you. Um, it's been an amazing five years. I hope to be back again in another five and another five after that. Uh, I will be doing this as long as I can. And that's really all I can say. Thanks again. <laughs>